Welcome back to the 411 Podcasting Network. I am your host, Larry Zonka, and this is episode 111 of the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. Remember that you can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, the 411mania.com website, and any major podcasting platform. Please make sure to subscribe to our show, share us around on social media, and if you have time, leave us a five-star review on the podcasting platform of your choosing. Joining me, as always, since it's the Thursday show, is my good friend Steve Cook. Steve, how are you tonight? Oh, I'm doing as fantastic as I can be under the circumstances of the quarantine era. There you go, dude. And that's uh, that's all you can say, right? <laughs> I mean, for the most part. I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah. I don't know what else to say. Not exactly a lot changing these days. Not not really. I mean, you can get out from time to time. Uh, you can go to the park if, you, if there are enough people around. If you can... I can find some places to go. I, I get out probably a lot more than a lot of people do since I still have a job that requires me to leave the house. So I'm not doing as poorly as a lot of people are, although a lot of people are probably making more money than me. Understood. Yeah. It's, they're uh, getting those, if they're getting if they getting those checks, you know what I'm saying? That's right. It's um it's a it's a weird time, Steve, for sure. <clears throat> but the good news is we're here to talk some professional wrestling. Yeah. And uh, we will ha- try to have a good time and take your guys' mind off everything. Steve, first up on our news roundup is something that we forgot to address a couple weeks back, and I think it's because we didn't like the John Moxley Jake Hagar match. But right. with John Moxley winning that match, John Moxley is now the recognized reigning and defending lineal Lucha Underground champion of the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's our that's our top story. Where that's where we're leaning with this week. We're leaning with John Mox being the, the reigning lineal Lucha Underground champion. That's where we're going. That's what we're doing. Well, I'm trying to lighten the mood. How much did how it. much did your boy Chris uh, Van Lucha Underground guy pay you to lead off of this? First of all, if anybody would have tried to pay me, it would have been the Cubs fan. Uh, the Cubs fan, a good man, a gentleman, scholar, keep me up tra- uh, up to date on all those. Renegade Triple A shows with Dr. Wagner Jr. and Pentagon Jr. and uh, L.A. Park. Oh, man, I wish I could watch those shows. Those sound like a good time. That's right. But, yeah, no, I uh, wanted to lighten the mood. But, yeah, it's just a, a funny little side note when you think about it. Uh, you know, because obviously Lucha Underground is not coming back. And People are trying to tell me that, you know, there's a, oh, well, is uh, John Moxley's Lucha Underground. Uh, Lucha. You got me confused now. I was going to say John Moxley's AEW championship reign. They're trying to say, oh, he's been a disappointing champion. Well, 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 what the fuck? I mean, have you seen what we're dealing with here? Okay. He would not be a disappointing champion under, under these circumstances. You know what, Steve? Sake. Steve, this is a great segue into something else I actually wanted to talk about. All right. I want to tell people, stop being fucking idiots, okay? <laughs> stop trying to be ahead of the curve. Stop trying to call Drew McIntyre, Braun Strowman, Dean Ambrose, anybody else with a world title now, a fucking flop as a champion. Who is Dean Ambrose? Sorry, John Moxley. I know. For God's sakes, man. But you know what I mean, dude. I was. Yeah, it's just, yeah, I, I keep you. seeing these fucking narratives, man. Now listen, Braun may very well only be a transitional champion, but if he's a flop, it's not totally going to be his fault. He has no chance to draw a live attendance. There's no live reaction. Same for Drew. Same for John Moxley. This is not their fault, okay? They're doing the best they can. Now, you may not be enjoying John Moxley's title run, these people that are saying that, Stephen. That's fine if you don't enjoy it personally. But stop with this bullshit narrative that it's he, that they're a fucking flop. It's yeah, the stupidest seen, shit I've heard. I've seen Bill Triagas. It's just like, what the... What are you trying to... Uh, I, I don't understand these people. Other than they're just trying to be negative for sake of being narrative, it's being negative and just trying, you know, to build narratives for other people to be champion or whatnot. Like, you know, anybody at this point. I mean, for Drew Mac. I mean, Drew McIntyre. I'll give him a lot of credit because the guy's trying. He's going out there every week on these MC Arena shows and he's trying to be a great Bayface champion. And he seems very charismatic to me. And it seems like, I mean, from what I from what I see. He seems like a good guy. It seems like it's working, but it's impossible to tell because how can you freaking tell when you can't have people going to shows, when you can't have this and that, and when people are sick of watching MT Arena shows on television anyway. So there's no way for me to tell whether Drew McIntyre is a flop or not. I have no idea. I think it would have been fine, but we'll never know. 
And the other thing is, listen, I mean, yeah, WWE ratings have been tailing down for a while anyway, but stop pointing to the fucking ratings. The, the ratings don't mean a goddamn thing right now in this setting and this whole pandemic era. Because, I mean, like we talked about, the empty arena thing was going to lose its luster. People were going to get sick of it. The only people who are watching are the hardest to hardcore and people that write about the goddamn shit. Yes. That's okay? the only reason you and I are watching. That's for goddamn sure. So it's like, <laughs> listen, it's like, stop with the whole, I want to be ahead of the curve and crown these people as horrible champions already. It is like it is up there with the worst of takes right now. Yeah, as much as I, as I will, would like to say, you know, I would like to say Braun Strowman is a flop. I can't say that because I don't freaking know. <laughs> you know, I mean, if there was if there if it was a regular time period in wrestling, I'd be able to tell you. But uh, no, I can't bury him either. As much as I would maybe like to, you know. Yeah, is what it is. And I, I want to talk about some other bad takes in wrestling, Steve. Apparently last week, Kenny Omega created a fucking wrestling sin by giving an enhancement guy some offense. <laughs> this was apparently a big talk on social media that I oh, saw. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And people were doing nothing but complaining about this. Now, I understand that the fan base in a lot of aspects online is skewing much younger these days. And I'm an older gentleman and you're getting up there, Steve. But have these motherfuckers yeah. never watched a Ric Flair match? <laughs> have you yeah, never this... watched WCW Saturday night and Ric Flair going 10 minutes with Brad Armstrong or George fucking South with all due respect, love them both. You know, it's funny because I wrote a column last week for the chair about how much I love the fact that we have jobber matches back now. I, I have always enjoyed the era because when I started watching professional wrestling back in 1990, and I sound really fucking old right now, but this is what it is. You know, I watched uh, WF Superstars and WF Wrestling Challenge, and most of those shows were jobber matches, guys getting killed by, you know, guys who were actually built these top, top stars. There weren't competitive matches on those shows. There were guys, there were, you know, superstars coming out for meant to squash some geek. And that's what I grew up, grew up on. And, of course, once we got to Monday Night Era, we had uh, that went away because, God forbid, anybody... You know, tune away because it's a non-competitive match, and they kept that going on even after there was no competition anymore because they just wanted to have 50-50 booking because uh, reasons. I don't know why. <laughs> I, don't, I I don't have an explanation for any of that, but I know. I guess we're now we're to this point where the jobber matches are coming back. I'm a big appreciator of it, and I think it gives a lot of people an opportunity to stand out. I point out in that article that, you know, somebody like Anna Jay gets a contract because she had a match with Sheeta and she's only had like five fucking matches in her career. But she looked enough against Sheeta where it's like, OK, man, let's pick her up. Let's let's sign her. Sounds like a good piece of business. And all these people getting the, these chances as far as Kenny Omega goes. And I'm getting to a point here, I swear to God. But Kenny Omega, you have to remember, Kenny is a. Executive Vice President of All Elite, All Elite Wrestling, along with uh, Nick and Matt Jackson, with Cody and all these guys. So he is not somebody like you know. You see Lance Archer, you see Brody Lee. These guys are just going to squash guys because they don't care. And that's their job and the role they should play. Kenny wants to see what these guys have to offer. So yeah, he's gonna he's gonna take his time, and he's a guy who who likes to have longer matches anyway. So he's just kind of, you know, he's going to kind of lay back. He's going to kind of jerk around or whatever. He's going to see what this guy has to offer. This, I think, uh, like Alex Angles or something like Alex Angels. Yeah, I think his like name that. was. Something no, no, like that. No, no, no disrespect to the young man. He did a good job. Mm -hmm. No disrespect to the guy at all. Absolutely not. But, uh, you know, Kenny is an EVP. And he's looking for future talent. So he wants to kind of hang back and see if this guy has something to offer. Guys like Brody, guys like Lance Archer don't care about that. So even from a kayfabe perspective, because, you know, we all know that these guys are vice presidents because they point out being the lead on these shows. Why wouldn't Kane take his time and see what the guy has to offer? I don't I had no problem with that match at all. I know your good friend. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Ryan Leather or what, Lace or whatever the fuck. I don't know. Something like that. Whatever his name is. And he had he had some kind of major issue with it. And here's another thing, too. To I mean, you know, you brought up the Anna J thing, and that's the point I wanted to make. 
AEW doesn't have a fucking warehouse of 200 geeks that they can trot out in jobber matches. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they, 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 they have QT Marshall, his school, and the local Georgia scene at that time. Okay. They did what they needed to do. They needed to fill some TV time. Like you said, Anna J got signed. Who knows? Maybe this young man impressed enough and he might get signed. You don't know. Maybe. This is a whole different animal than WWE. And part of this is people being brought up on only WWE. And I'll tell you another reason that this didn't bother me. Because when Kenny Omega was on the rise in New Japan and he was heading towards the championship, Steve. Do you know he worked an overly competitive 15-minute match with a certain young lion? Hmm. Gave him a lot. Kenny Omega ended up winning in the end with, not the one-winged angel, the V-trigger. Okay. Do you know who this young lion was, Steve? I don't. Um, He was a certain gentleman named Jay White, which later on became the Hmm. IWGP heavyweight champion. Well, there you have it. There you have it. You know, sometimes... I'm not saying Eric Angels is going to win the AEW title, but what I'm saying is... Look at Ric Flair. He was never hurt going 10 or 12 minutes with Brad Armstrong or George South or fucking Kendall Windham or anybody like that. This isn't going to hurt Kenny. I understand that people are like, well, Kenny doesn't feel like the same star as he was in New Japan. But then there's people that are acting like Kenny's having a fucking slew of bad matches when before the whole pandemic hit, he was fucking killing it here this year. He was, yeah, that he was on a roll, and quite frankly, you know, the people who are saying that Kenny Omega was not a star in AEW, they're again put the rest, because that guy was on a roll. He was, he, you know, as soon as, once we get Hangman and Page back on here, oh boy, that's when it's going to pick up. And I also want oh. to add on Kenny, he had one of, and depending on who you talk to, one of, if not the best empty arena matches so far this era with Trent. Yep, that's right, that's right, and... You know, Trent was part of another uh, top-notch entry in a match this week. Yeah. Trent's a guy who's had a pretty good string. But since we're talking AEW, uh, PW Insider, I want to give credit here, obviously, has some news on uh, the the last few weeks of TV and how they were written and everything. Uh, basically, the report says uh, the shows that were taped in Georgia were all written by AEW President Tony Khan. Uh, Tony Khan realized that with uh, basically the shit hitting the fan, um, they were going to have a small crew due to the shut-in rulings around the country and the lack of international talent being able to come in. And he basically had to sit down and write TV and what was described in a matter of minutes built around the TNT Championship Tournament (laughs) and using the local talents that were available. Um, It's described as a trial-by-fire moment for Tony Khan and the crew as they had to quickly pivot all their plans to come up with something that could further the company's storylines and utilize their uh, reduced resources in terms of talent and crew. So if you've watched Dynamite the last few weeks and you've uh, you see it all that played out, I think we can agree, Steve. They've had some strong TV going on here. They've only had one third of their talent, as we've talked about the skeleton crew. Yeah. And uh, so this was Tony Khan, and uh, Cody was said to be very instrumental in helping put things together, basically as his right hand man. Chris Jericho has also gotten a lot of praise for helping out, as long as jumping in uh, to do commentary on what yeah. is described as twenty four hours notice. Yeah. <laughs> and he was also behind putting together the uh, inner circle um, bubbly bunch stuff. Yes, which has all been freaking fantastic. We'll get we'll get to that segment a little bit later on too, which is amazing. And speaking of amazing. Your, and speaking of your friends, Orange Cassidy and the best friends. Yes. PW Insider says they have also gotten a lot of praise for their work as they wrestled each wrestled four times over a twenty four hour period during the tapings. Uh, pretty much everybody else that was involved, including the enhancement talent, were said to have put in a ton of work to make everything click together. It was described to uh, PW Insider's Mike Johnson as a big bonding moment for everybody involved. And um, many of the in- enhancement talents were personally brought in by QT Marshall, as we had hypothesized, Steve. Sure, sure, absolutely. And uh, I would say, and they have done a, as good a job as you could be expected. It hasn't all been gold. You know, it hasn't been all like five star type stuff, but I can't say it's been terrible TV throughout. There might have been a week stretch or, or so, but uh, for the most part, it's been pretty solid stuff. I gotta give him credit. Yeah, and th- and in terms of in in terms of bringing in the enhancement guys, I think they've been really good overall for enhancement guys because two hundred five live still used enhancement guys from time to time, and they brought in some horrible people. <laughs> and this is WWE who can either. Yeah. Find the best local guys, or they can easily use somebody from NXT and chose not to. 
Uh, so I think that's a credit to AEW there as well. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know what WWE's thought process is when they choose their jobbers, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on as well. You know, whenever they choose somebody, it's just going to go out there and lose. I don't, I don't understand the thought process. I just don't. It's very confusing. Like, I understand using guys like Brendan Vink and uh, Denzel Desjardins who have never made NXT TV. But That's then, fine. I have no problem with that. Yeah, but then you have fucking Akira Tozawa job in three minutes on Raw when he's in yep. a tournament on NXT TV. That makes no sense. Horrible idea. And I'm not even I'm not even gonna hate on putting, having Jinder Mahal beat him. That's fine because they're Bill and Ginger. And I think there's kind of some mileage in the Ginger and Drew McIntyre program because they have some history there. But fuck, why are you throwing Akira Tozawa out there for that? Have any other of the 50 guys you have hang out there in Performance Center do that? I, I don't get it. And speaking of General Hall, that's a point I want to talk about. I would like to, I don't want to rant. I don't want to yell. I would like to kindly ask a certain segment of people online to please stop it with your Jinder Mahal shit. It's <laughs> not funny. He is not a big star. He is not a good wrestler. He did not draw as champion. You're not funny. If you believe it, I guess that's fine in your own little world, but quite honestly, if you seriously believe Jinder Mahal is a major star and a blockbuster guy that's going to make a ton of money that is a good professional wrestler, you don't know anything about professional wrestling. I'm sorry. I I'm don't want to be rude. I'm not I'm saying that saying you're he, wrong. You can get a I'm challenger. I'm saying fine for like a raw program of Jinder with yes. the Drew McIntyre. There's, a, there's some history there. They can build that up for a week or two and have a nice little TV match is what I'm saying. No, and I agree with that. That is fine. But there are people, Steve, out there that believe that Jinder Mahal is some kind of fucking icon and legend. <laughs> and it is, I am sorry, I'm not trying to be insulting. It is the stupidest shit I've ever heard. Not everybody has to be an icon legend. And I think, you know, and I say that Jinder is fine for like that mid-card heel, mid-card heel type role. You know, I'd rather see Jinder Mahal tried out there than King fucking Corp at this point. I mean, I don't necessarily disagree <laughs> how about, because how do you King like, Corbin yeah, I mean, I mean, you want to see Jinder Mahal, King Corbin? Now. I know that's like a coin flip, and like that's like heads, I heads. <laughs> that, that's I like tails that's like, shoes. do I watch Sean Spears or do I watch De- Dexter Loomis? And I'm sorry, oh I'm my his, god! And I'm sorry, I'm gonna pick Sean Spears over Dexter Loomis, though. Oh my god! I was so pissed off when I was I was watching. The, I you know, Sean Spears comes out to face some jobber, and I'm just like. I don't need to see this. I flip over to NXT. It's fucking Dexter Loomis. Like, what? God damn. <laughs> what? I can't. So I had to stick with Sean Spears, for God's sakes. Because, for God, I mean, are we still, and are they still, are you trying to push Dexter Loomis as something people want to see? Allegedly so, Steve. Good God. So, <sighs> don't no. give me, yeah. But Triple H is a genius. He's a mastermind. Let me tell you. Sure. Know. Yeah, so, absolutely. So anyway, we probably should have started with this one, but uh, I, did, I wanted right. to lighten things off to begin with a little bit and have some fun. But uh, yeah. there are rumors that WWE is reportedly, allegedly, in negotiations to sell either the network or the whole company to either Fox or ESPN, Steve. Well, why wouldn't they be? Did you see Vince this past Friday night on SmackDown? Looking rough. Yeah, he's got to be looking. I mean, yeah, let's let's be honest here. They got to be looking for that deal. I mean, if you're like, I mean, if you're thinking like uh, Vince, who is uh, not looking good, not looking in great shape, not looking. I mean, as much as the Wall Street people want to tell me he's a mastermind and a genius, I saw him on Friday night. He didn't look great. He didn't look good. And you know. I, why wouldn't you try to sell out to one of the bigger companies and hope they give Triple H and Stephanie a good job? That sounds like uh, that sounds like good business to me, good sir. Do you think it actually happens, say, within the next two years? Legit. <sighs> it is very tough to say. Um, I don't know how the... Uh, especially since you know with the with the virus and with everything going on with the economy being what it is they're not gonna get it's tough to get that ufc deal now you know maybe if they tried a year ago they could have got a couple billion dollars and now it's gonna be tougher to get a couple billion dollars 
because you know Disney and all these people are looking at the bottom line. There's stuff being shortened up. So, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't see it happening. At least in the next couple of years. Yeah, I don't feel it happening I either. I think it's just it feels like a bunch of bullshit right now. The only thing that makes me feel that it's possible at all as is due to the current state of live sporting events. Yeah. ESPN and Disney might be looking at something to fill up ESPN with for a while until things really get going. And if you bundle in the network with the Disney Plus and ESPN Plus stuff, uh, you know, see, it's a stretch. It's I, a str- I see what you're. I see what you're saying, but it's, it's still kind of a stretch right now. No, I think it's a stretch too. I'm saying that the only thing that makes me think it's a very small possibility is that. But yeah, that's been um, making the rounds this week. So that's uh, I guess it is what it is, Steve. Yeah, I mean, and. Good Lord, I wouldn't blame <laughs> I wouldn't blame them for trying, for God's sakes. I mean, unfortunately, they missed their window, quite frankly. Yeah. When they had their stock price up around 100 you know, that would have been a good time to sell. But, uh, yeah, they, they missed it. So, Steve, I, I do have bad news for you. I, I know this one's going to hurt you. Your good, close, <laughs> personal friend, Kane Velasquez, has been cut by the WWE. <sighs> yeah, that, that, that one hurts. Man, did that guy have a stellar run with the company or what? Oh, man. He did so many great things with that company. He uh, came down after Brock Lesnar beat beat Kofi Kingston. And I guess they had a match in Saudi Arabia I didn't see. Yeah, he lost in like three minutes to Brock in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I didn't watch that. Yeah, but, uh, and that was it. So, remember back in the day when everybody rumored that, well, Dice W tried bringing Yokozuna to lose to Hulk Hogan. Or, you know, in fact, when Ultimate Warrior came to WCW, you lose Hulk Hogan. So, Kane Velasquez came to WWE to lose Brock Lesnar. That's what happened, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the deal. Al Isaacs is right on top of that ship. He's telling you. <laughs> they're just going to bring in this Kane Velasquez asshole to lose to Brock Lesnar, and that'll be it. That's what happened. I don't know if that's what they intend, but that's exactly what happened. Brock guys went back. God bless him. Brock Lesnar is a smart man pro wrestling. You can't tell me otherwise. No, he he is up there, dude. You cannot doubt that at all. But yeah, Kane's uh, run was gone, which uh, was unfortunate simply for the fact that um, he showed some flashes that he could be really good when he made his AAA appearance. Yeah, AAA. Uh, he showed some flashes there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he wanted. To, I I remember hearing from I think the Cubs fans, some other people. He wanted to do. He was more interested in doing the lucha libre. You know that style. Yep. More than more than the WWE sports entertainment for wrestling shit. So, yeah, I mean WWE signed them away, so they you know, you know that that's what WWE's strategy's been the past five ten years, just to sign people away so they can't do anything. Yeah, and that's the thing. They they brought him in because they wanted to get Brock that win over him and tell yep. that story. But the other part is like you just mentioned. Triple A was going to be doing stuff in the U.S. with them. They didn't like that. There were rumors that AEW was interested. You can't have that. Nope. So, yeah, WWE snatched them up, took them off the table, used them basically once, and got rid of them. Just a complete fucking waste of money. (laughs) All right? I mean, I know WWE wants to keep everybody away from these other companies, and maybe Cain Velasquez makes a difference to the AEW. But probably not as much of a difference as WWE paid to have them. <sighs> this wacky <laughs> world of wrestling, Steve. Ah, <sighs> good lord. Speaking of releases, we had all those releases recently, and the word going around right now is WWE is basically looking to grant releases to just about anyone who requests one. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. I mean, it, like, that's my we'll thought see. process at first because. Yeah, like we'll if, if the that. big dog walks up to Vince and says, "I want to release," he can't release Roman Reigns. <laughs> is Roman Reigns still? I have not heard Roman Reigns' name in several weeks. I don't know. Is he still alive? Is he still? I don't know. The big dog is chilling at home with his uh, lovely pregnant wife and uh, saying, "Fuck off with all this shit." Well, that's well, he should be. That's right. Uh, Steve, know. you know, Steve, we will um, yeah, I don't have much to say about that. Cause I kind of doubt they're going to release a ton of people. Plus if you're under contract right now and making money, I don't think you really want to hit the market unless they, they forcefully release you. 
Yeah, yeah, and we'll, and we'll get to a point later when we're talking about Drake Maverick and that that whole fiasco. Whatever right. the fuck is going on with that. So, right. Steve, we've talked about this before. You've uh, watched the uh, WoW Superstars of Wrestling along with myself. Sure. Um, you remember on that show a, a young lady who we used to see in Shimmer by the name of Navia tagging with Jessica Havoc? Yes, absolutely. Navia, okay. the uh, oh, one half. She was also part of the uh, Ohio is for Killers uh, team with. Uh, I forget which Chris she's married to, but she's uh, uh, yeah, married to Jay Christ. Jay Christ, okay. Yeah. She's and if she's married to one of them, I mean, she's with them and Sammy Callahan, all those people. Yeah, she made her uh, Impact Wrestling debut on the Rebellion special on Tuesday night. Uh, appearing during a Havoc Rosemary match, did not get involved, just kind of standing around teasing. So, uh, Steve, you think that's a good pickup for the old Impact Wrestling? Well, it's a logical pickup. I mean, you're looking for uh, different talent, and uh, I think Nevea, I mean, with Nevea being closely united with the Chris Brothers, that's an obvious pickup to make. It only makes sense. Plus, you can see. obviously tag her with um, Havoc. Sure. I mean, that's a tag team right there. That might be a feature for you. To, you don't know. But, uh, you know, I, it's always good to look within uh, the family, within uh, personal relationships and whatnot. I, I don't blame her for that at all. And she, from what I've seen, the is a perfectly competent wrestler. So, good for her. Yeah, I think it's definitely a solid addition to the roster. Uh, Steve, you know, a while ago we talked about Impact Wrestling. They were going to do the TNA special over WrestleMania weekend, which unfortunately got canceled during the whole pandemic and everything. Happens. And uh, they had shot, though, a uh, one-hour quote-unquote TNA special that they aired the week of because that was going to be part of the build for that special. Um, and apparently it did very well on Access TV. Uh, people at Access TV and Anthem were very happy with the special. And apparently they're wanting to add more TNA into the current Impact product. Yes, apparently they are from what I've uh, what I've seen and what I've, what I've heard, yes. And that was uh, part of the build of that special was Moose running down former TNA geeks and beating them. And then on last night's uh, Rebellion Part 2 special with no world title main event, Moose came out dressed as the Ultimate Warrior, basically, and he's done, like, homages to Randy Savage in the past, too. Okay. He came out dressed as the Ultimate Warrior, wearing the TNA Old School World Championship, Steve. Okay. Claiming he was the TNA World Champion, and they had a main event with him, Michael Elgin, and Hernandez. Moose won, and he's basically proclaiming himself the TNA World Champion, Steve. What do you think of the idea of bringing in some TNA to Impact? And rumors from, according to PW Insider, are... This could lead to possibly them doing another hour of TV on Access TV, maybe just branded as TNA or just mixing it in. What are you thinking? I'm going to tell you my true honest thoughts on this whole situation. As far as my nostalgia for TNA goes, let me know when they bring in the NWA World Heavyweight Champion. There you go. Because the best era of TNA was when they had the NWA titles. Am I right? Am I wrong? Come on. There was a lot of good stuff during that time that I That's liked. right. That uh, you know, the best time of TNA was when you had when they had the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, whether it was you know, as usually Jeff Jarrett, whether it's AJ Styles or Christian Cage had some time that thought was Kurt Angle. You know, that that's kind of part of what what made TNA kind of you know, as kind of ridiculous as it got from time to time during the early days. Part of what legitimized it as a brand was that the fact that they had even though the NWA title had been, you know, kind of bastardized over years, it still kind of counted as, like, you know, a legitimate... Are you besmirching anyway. the good name of the Colorado Kid, Steve? Yes, I am. I'm besmirching <laughs> Colorado Kid. Absolutely. Colorado Kid, if you hear me, I'm besmirching you. But, uh, you know, as much as they've been besmirched, the NWA title still has a certain meaning to certain people like you and I. And certain people... I mean, people watch the NWA Power Show right now, for God's sake. So, that's kind of... The, I mean, honestly, the most, the best period of TNA for me was when they had the rights and the access to the NWA World Heavyweight title. So, so, what, so what you're saying is you want to see Impact Champion Tessa Blanchard versus yes. TNA Champion Moose versus NWA yes. Champion Nicholas Aldis. Goddamn right. That'd be awesome. All right. There you go. <laughs> All right. Book the territory, that'd Steve. That'd be good stuff. I'm okay with that. That'd be, that would be some good stuff. Hey, And, and then the... And the Nick, winner could be the mega champion. Absolutely. And hey, and Nick Aldis obviously has history in TNA, so Yes, he does. 
So bring them all, bring them all together. Get uh, Anthem. Ah, uh, well, Billy Corgan still hates him. I was gonna say, I don't think Billy Corgan is gonna be working with him anytime soon. Yeah, that's kind of a problem there. So that's the kind of situation. But uh, no, I have no problem. I mean, especially if Tessa is not of, if Tessa Blanchard is not available at work shows right now, then fine. You have a different world champion. Have have Moose have a belt. I have no problem with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, will- I mean. Yeah. Not like Jordan Devlin getting pissed off about people having different championships. It's all right. Yeah. I, I think at the very least it's creative. They're trying to make the best of a bad situation. It plays into the character Moose was doing. And, hey, I mean, I don't have the numbers for Access TV because they don't make the normal Nielsen ratings and everything. Right. But, I mean, if that special did good. Yeah, that's and, what they say. And sure. if the Rebellion thing ends up doing good with the Moose angle and stuff, it, at least you try, I guess. I don't think they would say it did a good number just to just to blow smoke up their asses, you know. I mean, if it, if it did bad numbers, they probably would just uh, sweep it under the rug, right? Well, you would think so, but I'm saying, yeah, like I like said, I don't, I don't have actual access to the numbers, so I can't verify. But so what I'm I assume saying is, that they probably did good for them. I if, uh, I have no reason to not believe them. So, but we'll see what happens there. Like I said, it's it's at the very least interesting, and I will give them credit for that. I thought the Re- Rebellion show last uh, on Tuesday was a like kind of a low level good show. I think overall the two shows were really solid. They made the best of uh, the situation with uh, you know they didn't have the world champion there. They didn't have one of the world yeah. champion challengers. They didn't have the knockouts champion. They didn't have her challenger. They had to rebook a lot of that. They did the best. I think they were very smart making it a. My suggestion was either making it a TV special or putting it on the Impact Plus service because you already have subscribers. But, I mean, yeah, that was the best that they could do with that. So, I think it was a smart move. And, um, again, you have to do what you have to do during this time frame, you know? Yeah. Nothing. It's the same thing as having an interim X to an interim X to Cruiserweight champion. Yeah, it's the same, right. same kind of thing. And, eventually, you know, once we get everybody back, we can have the unification match. That's right. Or you can have a different brand on a different night. You know, if you want to make more programming and employ more people, I'm not going to argue about it. I'm not going to complain about it. That's fine. Yeah. So the last thing in the news roundup, and this is credit to the old fellows at Voices of Wrestling, uh, here's the skinny on the AEW stuff coming up here. Um, AEW, we go live next week, Steve. May 13th is taped. May 20th is live as it's the go home for double or nothing. And the post double or nothing schedule is to be determined at this time. Tony Khan has confirmed that these shows will not have full crews because the international talent are still unavailable. And anybody mm. uncomfortable with participating in the shows can continue to be excused as they have been already. He expects to have double the talent available to them as opposed to the Georgia tapings. And um, he noted that AEW has to continue to cont- uh, provide new content to not default on their television contract. Because right now, along with the pay-per-view, that's their only revenue streams because they don't have live crowds anymore. Steve, they're live next week, May 6th. Do the Revival debut because they have no non-compete clause. <laughs> oh, man, I, I would like to see that. That'd be pretty good. They've already got their new t- tag team name and all that, so I wouldn't be shocked. And if the if the California crew can get out to uh, get out there, I could see that working. Well, I think they are because, I mean, Kazarian's on the show next week. Ah, fair point. They did announce Kazarian in a match, so maybe we'll see all these guys. So, yeah, sure, why not the revival? And my main question here, Larry Zonka, is to you, actually, because Shoot. I hear about this Double or Nothing show happening, and I just wonder, are they really gonna expect people to pay fifty nine ninety nine or where the hell for the show? I... I don't know. I mean, I, I assume they're charging, and uh, pay-per-view companies are the one that set the price, so it's probably going to be that the gonna normal get, price. You, yeah, how's that going to go? Do you think that's going to work out for them? Um, I think it's. I think it will end up being okay because I think they have a very loyal fan base. I don't think they're going to draw 100,000 pay-per-view buys like the last several pay-per-views. I think they will do a okay amount of buys. But um, again, I mean, it's... Not preferable in this time frame to do the show, but unfortunately they have a contract with the pay-per-view providers, and if they don't provide the set number of pay-per-views in the year, they default on that and they lose out on money. 
And okay. considering they have no live attendance, and I'm sure merchandise sales are probably not likely doing extremely well, just online only, they have to fulfill the TV rights contract. They have to fulfill the pay-per-view contract. I don't like it. I don't think it's great, but it's an unfortunate uh, side effect to doing business with uh, Turner and the pay-per-view companies. Yeah, and for I mean, I would say for the most part, doing business with Turner has done pretty well for them, to be honest. You know, oh, it has. I'm just talking in terms of, I mean, yeah. I think ideally they would they would have liked to just bulk tape again, but I also think they feel the pressure to freshen things up to head into the pay-per-view to try to do as many buys as possible. Unfortunately, Big Dead events got it cleared for them. They got it, you know, Linda gave them all the money where the fuck they didn't, you know, the... We well, you know Linda passed some money to the Florida governor to make things happen. So, and then AEW's gonna pussyfoot and back and back and follow them in there. So uh, I don't know. It's just uh, that that felt kind of lame to me. You know, you know, uh, doesn't it, doesn't it seem kind of lame that you know once Vince puts the bill for everybody going to Florida, that you know eventually AEW kind of feel, follows them in. Doesn't seem kind of cheesy. Yeah, the, the whole thing feels really weird, Steve. I don't fucking unprecedented times, dude. I don't, I don't know what the hell to think. But apparently, they're going to sh- be shooting at an undisclosed location somewhere in Florida for the pay per view, and they're going to tape it, and we'll see what happens. And we'll say that Kazarian's wife has been conspicuously uh, silent lately about people staying at home. Well, there That's you all go. I can say about that. <laughs> that's all. That's all I can say about that whole situation. I don't well, know. Daddy got to make she's, some money, Steve. She is really. Uh, she's really vocal about that at, at some point, and more recently, she's been kind of quiet. I don't know. Right. Well, speaking of AEW, Steve, we have a show to review. AEW Dynamite. For, Dynamite. What is this? April 29th? Jesus yeah, Christ! So much yeah. May. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever day it is. We opened with a really good video package hyping up the Darby Allen versus Cody feud. Looking back on their draw from the summer, Cody winning the rematch and their desires to win the TNT championship. And we are then welcomed by Le Champion and Tony Schiavone. Yes, yes. Uh, the best announced team in the business. They are very damn good. I'm telling you, nobody else better win those awards than when it comes up in December. So we opened up our first match in light, TNT Championship Tournament semifinal match. Cody Rhodes defeating Darby Allen at just over 20 minutes, Steve. What did you think of our opener for the night? Uh, I love watching these guys wrestle. I lo- I've, I've watched all their matches so far. I didn't think they have they have awesome chemistry with each other. I love kind of the th- – I mean, I mentioned it, I think, last week when I was talking about – we talked about Darby Allen versus Sammy Guevara, and it's kind of the three-way deal with Cody and with Sammy and with Darby. It's like it's just they all work with each other just fantastically. So I loved watching that, and uh, they had some good stuff going on. There were some a couple interesting spots. I saw where uh, Cody uh, kind of took his wife out, and they tried to blame Darby on it, but now Cody just took her out. That's what happened there. I also noticed that Darby distracted the referee while Britt Baker attacked Cody with her shoe. Did you notice that? I know. I was kind of a little curious, right? All kind of shenanigans going on. Yeah. Is there, is there some... They might be in cahoots, Miss uh, Britt Breaker and Darby Allen. I don't know. It seemed a little interesting they, to they, me. They, they seem like two people that would hang out socially outside of wrestling. They're, they're good people. That's so right. I understand it. <laughs> they seem like... They both seem like good people, so I would see that. So, uh, but yeah, good stuff. And... Uh, Oh, man, just when it looked like Darby's going to get the upper hand. And I was rooting for Darby here. Why not? Because I'd like to see Darby get the big win over Cody. And he winds up hitting that coffin drop. And sure enough, Cody kind of rolls him to a pinning scenario. And, ugh. You know, so Cody moves on to the final, which makes sense. And uh, I think you're... I think I think that Darby Allen's long-term kind of story here is when he eventually finally gets that big win over Cody. It's kind of like how Tommy Dreamer couldn't beat Raven forever and ever and ever, and finally Tommy Dreamer gets a win over Raven. And I think that's kind of what they're going for here, where finally, eventually down the road, Darby Allen gets that big win over Cody. I think so as well. Um, I, I enjoyed this one tremendously as well. I thought it was really good. I thought the match had a really strong structure to it. I thought both guys got the shine. I liked, uh, you know, Darby stole crossroads at one point. Cody tried to do the... Uh, coffin drop as yeah. well. Uh, I kind of like when you get deep into a feud, not only do you play off of past matches, but you eventually get that string where both guys start to steal each other's shit a little bit. 
Yeah, I, I like that. Uh, Darby again continues just to show his growth as a performer. He's really good, and you know, like you said, Cody winning it makes the most sense. I saw a lot of people shitting on the finish, Steve. Yeah, I, and I can understand why. It's, it looked a, it looked a, a little bit lame. I'll be honest. Yeah, I think it could have been done a little better, but I didn't think like people were like, oh, it made Darby look so stupid. I was like, I don't think it necessarily made him look stupid. It's just, you know, Cody got one up on him. Cody's the experienced guy. And I and think it kind that, of builds up for later on when eventually, you know, it's part of the whole, I think that, that's the whole story we're leading into where Darby can't be Cody, but eventually he finally gets that win. Yeah. And when he beats him, hopefully it will be in front of a crowd. I think that will get a monster yeah. pop. Yeah. Yeah. So we got another uh, really good Scorpio Sky video package uh, talking about how he got into SCU he didn't want to be just the third guy in an established act since Daniels and uh, Kaz had been together so long. They helped him a lot. Talks about getting his world title match, something he thought he'd never get. And um, he basically said that he just doesn't want to be the best. He wants to be a fucking legend. So good on Scorpio Sky. I like yeah. these video packages. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Your good personal friend and salt of the earth, MJF arrives, Steve. Yes. Video package. Oh, that poor bastard. The, he he, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't looking too good this week. Well, Let's the good honest. news is that he had rehabbed his horrible <laughs> hangnail injury. <laughs> and the doctor had never seen anyone come back from death's door to recovery in such a fast time. Yeah. He now has the strongest nail in the history of nails, and he got TV ready. <laughs> but Steve, unfortunately, he was... MJF is a clean-shaven young man. He's the soul of the earth, and he, he injured his neck while shaving, and... A normal, yeah, yeah, happens. Yeah. a normal man would have bled out from such a fucking injury, Steve. I will tell you that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. But he survived, and uh, he wanted to uh, be back and wrestle in front of six or seven of his most trusted peers next week. <laughs> and he Which said, ones? said he will be back for us because he loves the fans. He is the light in the darkness that is better than all of us. I think he just wants to perform in front of Pineapple Pete. You think so? I think so. I think he wants to perform in front of Van and Jay. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm just saying. Who could blame him? If, if I was MJF, is a, that's where I would be. That's where I'd be directing my attention. Is all I'm saying about that whole situation. So, but MJF not trying, uh, to, be, not trying to be a you know a, a pervert or anything. I mean, I'm just saying. I get what you're saying. She's a lovely young lass, Steve. Yes, yes. Um. So here's the thing. I saw somebody brought this up. Has MJF started to surpass the old RNN updates with these past two videos? Because <laughs> they've been pretty good. Oh, that's pretty. Uh, that's a, that's a tough uh, tough nut to crack right there. I only hope that it doesn't lead to MJF being bore, boring for twenty years. Oh Christ! I know. <laughs> uh, did I just say that? Yeah, I just did. That's all right. So, uh, speaking of MJF, the Wardlow was in action next, Steve. Oh, he killed some poor asshole. Yeah. He killed a poor man named Musa, I believe, in uh, just over two minutes. And uh, yeah, the Wardlow killing geeks is just great. Well, did did the uh, I assume that Ryan Satin was okay with this? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't know because uh, Musa hit a back handspring elbow at some point. During oh this shit! Match or something. Well, that's not good. That's. But not you know good. what? According to Matt Hardy's rules of the jobbers, he's allowed one flurry. Okay, and yeah, we got a flurry. Okay, so, so, yeah. so I think All he's right. okay. Well, we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, Ryan's the expert now. I guess That's what so. I'm told. That's what I'm told. We got the return, um, part three of the Bubbly Bunch, Steve. Yes. Yes, we did. Jericho talked about oh. uh, last week's uh, oh. Flim Flam sensation and the victory by Sammy. Yes. And uh, Santana and Ortiz were kind of torn on who won. And then <laughs> Jericho determined that they were going to have an old-fashioned Manitoba melee. Yes, we did. We had a Manitoba melee. We had a and vir- Steve. We had a virtual brawl. Featuring- You'll tell me about the guest stars. Hang on, there are a lot of guest on. stars. We featured all the members of the inner circle. Yes, and I I don't know if I got I don't think I got everybody, but the the key names I caught were Peter Avalon, Jungle yeah. Boy, Sunny yep. Kiss, mm-hmm. Doctor Luther, yes, Lou fucking Ferrigno, yes, the Incredible Hulk, Kevin Smith. Yes. Chris Jericho's dad, Ted Irvine, and Vicky right. Guerrero. Chris, Chris Jericho's dad kicked the Hulk's ass. Yeah, that's definitely what happened <laughs> there. And Vicky Guerrero was smart enough to use a line that was not copyrighted by WWE, which I appreciate. It was fucking fantastic. I loved it. 
Great stuff. There were a couple other people in there I know I missed, but it, I, I about died at yeah, least. Yeah, I, I no saw int- a couple of that. I saw there were a couple people there. I was like, who is that? I don't know. I'm sure some yeah. other people know, but uh, Lou Ferrigno and Kevin Smith popping in along with Jericho's yeah. dad. was that's pretty good. Jericho's dad and laying smack down. And... Always good to see a Vicky. Always good to see Vicky. I like her. Yeah. So uh, a good time with the Bubbly Bunch again. They Again, they're making the most out of this stuff. Uh, in a match we had built up from last week, Steve, um, your good friends, the best friends, Chucky e. T and yes. Trent, yeah, facing off with it. Kip Sabian and Jimmy Havoc. We had Orange Cassidy and Penelope Ford at ringside. Yes, we did. No DQ, no count out tag team match. And in 13 and a half minutes, the best friends picked up the victory, Steve. What did you think of our match? I loved it. I loved this match. I thought these these four guys were going crazy. They were just doing all kinds of crazy shit. And, you know, there were no counts, no disqualification. That's what we got to do from time to time. The rules are thrown out. You all got to go crazy. And I thought that I, I loved it. I thought it was some great stuff. Great stuff. I, I really enjoyed this. It was, it was a good all-action plunder brawl. You got everybody involved. They looked like they were having a total blast. Um, it, it, everybody worked really hard. And, uh, yep. Chucky e. T killed a man with the awful waffle on a chair to he win. He really match. did. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few. Yeah, there are a few spots in that. Like, like, what the? F- <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> they're just they're having a lot of fun out there. They're killing each other. They're having a good. They're having a good time. And you know, Orange Cassidy doing his business. Penelope Ford looking, well, like Penelope Ford. Good lord. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Right? Exactly, dude. I mean... Oh, man. Fun times. Fun times. And the best friends have obviously emerged as the top contenders to the tag team championships whenever we can get a tag team title match. I think I think the best friends are probably next uh, team in line. And they might not be next team, tag team champions. I mean, it feels that they're next in line for sure. And, uh, I, I again, I thought this was good. I really enjoyed it. And I will say from everybody involved, including uh, Orange Cassidy and Penelope Ford... A pay per view caliber effort in terms of just overall yeah. effort here, man. Absolutely, there, there, that's some, that's some good shit. Might have been my personal match of the night. There you go. But yeah, it was definitely good stuff. A lot of fun. We got another Britt Baker video package in her <laughs> dental office, featuring a cameo from former TNA Impact star Rebel as her makeup artist. Which yes, she actually is a makeup that. artist and does makeup for AW a lot of the time. Yes, she does. So that, that is a little interesting to see. So Britt kept calling her, like her Reba. Pretty... Yeah, Reba. <laughs> and then uh, had to pull her aside and remind her to call her Dr. Britt Baker. That's and right. then she's like, listen, if you want me to make you into anything, you will put me over bro. <laughs> <laughs> which led to Reba putting her over big time and Britt That's approving. Right. <laughs> and then uh, Britt started uh, to do her lesson for the day, hyping her social media, mocking people that wear glasses to look smart, as well as fat uh, people and te- people with bad teeth. And in every picture, she was yeah. making fun of poor Tony Schiavone, Steve. How about that? Yeah. I, I mean, as, as kind and gentle as Tony Schiavone has been to her the past few weeks, he was the focal point of all these lessons. I'm not sure what's going on there. I mean, maybe my, it might have been one of those kind of things where, you know, you know, sometimes you try and encourage a friend to lose some weight or something. Maybe that's what she's trying to do with, with Tony. Maybe she's trying to encourage the guy. You know, maybe you could lose a couple pounds. I don't know. My, my, a little my heart was broken for Tony, but I will say, and I mean this in the most complimentary way, Britt was wonderfully bitchy here. It was great. <laughs> she's so good. Uh, yeah, she's... she. Uh, you know, ever since she made the heel turn and got hooked up with uh, Tony and uh, started doing this stuff, it's it's been fantastic. Love her. There you go. So next up, Sean Spears defeated Baron Black three minutes via submission using the C4 and then finishing with the sharpshooter, Steve. Sean yeah, Spears expanding of, the repertoire. Shades of Brett the Hitman Hart back in the day. Absolutely. And Chris Jericho put him over as a fine, good-looking, technical wrestling young Canadian gentleman. I don't, I don't know about young. But uh, everything else is accurate. Well, compared to Jericho, he's young. <laughs> yeah, compared to Jericho, sure, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not, uh, that's not a dig. That's just the truth. I mean, I think yeah. Jericho has like 11, 12 years on him. So I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, uh, the thing uh, uh, against this match on NXT was Dexter Loomis. Yeah. And again, I will take yeah, Sean Spears over Dexter Loomis. Absolutely. 
So we had another Sorry, we had another Taz breakdown video this time looking at Lance Archer's blackout finish. Yeah, like these little videos. We got a good little Marco stunt video package to build him up. Unfortunately, Steve, <laughs> the exalted one, Mister Brody Lee, killed young Marco stunt in just over three minutes. And um, I think that the two most important takeaways I have from this match are that Marco stunt was twenty three and he's dead, Jim. Yeah, that's all I got. That's all you need. There's no reason to have anything else. You know, Brody Lee should kill that guy. There's no reason to do anything else. That's right. No. They they, they teased us with that video hard, though. Like, Marco might get a little fight in this match. and uh, I don't think anybody would that uh, halfway. No, I don't think anybody thought he was going to win. But, I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> he had a couple hope spots against Lance Archer. I mean, he got, like, one here and was, like, just yeah. annihilated. Mr. Brody Lee is just taking care of business here. That's right. And, and uh, Dasha, obviously, is a very smart young lady, referring to him as the exalted one, Mr. Brody Lee, on his own. She has learned to call him Mr. Brody Lee. Smart yeah. lady. Got a John Moxley video package talking about how things have changed in the last eight weeks. Yeah. He's, he's thankful for his wife putting up with him for steel chairs to DDT people on. Said, apparently, they don't <laughs> teach you that in wrestling at Oklahoma. <laughs> apparently not. And he's happy that AEW is coming back live next week. He knows he's going to have a target on his back. Reminded everybody to uh, come at him with your own risk. And don't forget to call your grandmother and support your local businesses. Damn right. Good good messages from Mr. Moxley. That's right. Scheduled for next week, your good personal friend MJF returns, Steve. Yeah. John Moxley. John Moxley faces uh, Kazarian. And we have Matt Hardy and that pumpkin-headed dipshit Kenny Omega (laughs) facing off with... Le sex gods. Le sex gods. That's right. Oh boy. In a street fight, by Oh way. boy. Oh, that. Could... Katie bar the door. As long as say about that. Oh, so gonna be crazy. Main event of the evening, the last semifinal for the TNT Championship uh, tournament. Lance Archer facing off with Dustin Rhodes. Steve, they got. Did a... you notice how Dustin did not put his career on the line for this match? Well, he's smart. Yeah, exactly. Because he knew he's gonna die. <laughs> So they got a lot of time. Dustin was great in this match as the veteran. He had enough fight to where he never looked like he was looking like shit, but that he never took away from Lance Archer because Lance Archer dominated him. It was an overall, I thought, a really good presentation as Lance Archer wants nothing more than to take out Cody Rhodes at the orders of Jake Roberts. And to get to Cody, he has to get to the finals of this tournament. And to do that, he was willing to beat Cody's brother Bloody to get to him. That's right. So Lance Archer looks like a beast. Dustin is the resilient veteran. And it all comes down towards the end where Lance Archer is just beating the shit out of this man. Yes, QT he was. Marshall arrives yeah. to check on Dustin. He has a towel. Tease is throwing it in. Cody arrives and he stops him. He teases throwing in the towel. Dustin begs him not to, though. And Lance Archer finally finishes him with the claw, Steve. Uh, and what the claw? There you go. It's uh, kind of funny. We were talking about that the other day in a pre-recorded right. thing we're doing. And um, but yeah, I mean, I thought that as an overall presentation, this was really good. I thought it sets up the Cody Lance Archer match great. Dustin, he he gets his ass beat, but he doesn't look bad. And I know uh. you, I know you joked about this on Twitter, but I mean. It's an important part. Like, you look at certain things to build a next match. You know, Dustin hit crossroads in this match. Lance Archer was like, fuck off with the crossroads and kicked out at one. Yeah. So, obviously, that those are the little things that, like, what is Cody going to have to possibly do to win? Because we've seen him win with crossroads. We've seen him use cradles. We've seen him use the Cody cutter, the figure four. What is he going to have to do to beat this man who is running through people like nothing? I mean... He killed a job guy. He killed Marco Stunt. He largely destroyed Colt Cabana. He gave Dustin Rhodes an extended beating here and bloodied him. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it sets up for that match really, really well. Yeah, that's going to be an interesting uh, piece of business when it goes down. And, uh, yeah, I thought this was a largely good match. I mean, you could have shaved a little time off, but, uh, you know, at the same time, you got to fill time, right? So... It is, it is what it is during this quarantine era. You got to have some stuff to fill some time. 
And it's a little extra of Lance Archer being up on Dustin Rhodes. So, and no, it doesn't hurt Dustin. Doesn't Dustin get doesn't get hurt at all? No. Because at this point, he's he's pretty much untouchable with this audience. I would say. He really like, is. And... He do anything to that guy. It's all right. He's Dustin. It's all right. And here's the thing, care. like you know, we've talked about. You have to be careful with the empty arena matches going long. But if you look on this show, look at the people they trusted to go long. Cody and yeah. Darby, who have a great chemistry and have worked together a couple times already. Yeah. And Dustin Rhodes, who is a legit veteran that knows his shit and everybody loves, and Lance Archer, who is a really great monster. Yep. So they're trusting the right people with it. And then the other match that went long was not long as these, but like longer was the best friends tag yeah. and Kip and Jimmy Havoc, which depending on your taste, steps, you know, it was good. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say, depending on your taste, maybe, you know, your favorite match of the show. Like I, I think Darby and Cody was my favorite match overall, but I wouldn't yeah. argue with anybody that loved the, uh, the no DQ tag. Cause that was a good, I went with the tag myself. Yes. I thought that was a little bit better myself, but although as much I did love that Cody and Darby match, and I will love to see more matches from them. So, but I think it's um it's trusting the right people with the time is the key during this thing. Mm-hmm. So that's uh that is AEW for the night, Steve. Which means we have to talk NXT now. Also, April twenty yeah. ninth from uh from uh wherever the hell the performance center, I guess. The performance and, um, center in Orlando, Florida. Beth and Morrow talk- are back on commentary. Yeah, how about that? And uh, Moro emerging from the ashes. That's right. A little so, surprised by that. Yeah, we started off with uh, a Cruiserweight Championship tournament match. Isaiah Scott facing off with Elhia Del Fantasma. Yeah. Swerve Scott picks up the win, 11-20 via pin, Steve. And um, both men are now 1-1 one and one in the tournament overall. What did you think of our opener? A little surprising to see the result there, but uh, at the same time, I think they want to have some drama heading in, heading into the final matches. So Scott getting the win here would make sense for that. I mean, it, you know, it's all, as long as we're in the era of 50, 50 booking in WWE, you might as well have these, all these guys trading wins, right? You don't want to game bay over too much. Well, that would be unfortunate, wouldn't it? Why would El here to Del Fantasma need to win too many matches? That, that would be a bad idea. Pretty much. I was, yeah. um, how would you do that? I kind of figured Scott was going to win because I thought we, you know, WWE, we have to make it all interesting. And mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes I just think you need to book guys as stars and have them win. So, I mean, no, it, you know, I mean, yeah, that would, but that makes too much sense though, apparently. I mean, if, if we're, I'm, I think I'm a big fan of, uh, uh Phantasma slash King Queer now. He's fucking great in my book. And I would push him to the moon, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he should be just the 50-50 guy. I don't know. Well, we're going to find out. I thought it was a good little opener. The tournament continues, which has been a nice thing to have on NXT to fill some time. Yeah. And we got another match, uh, we got another match later on, too. Dominic Dajakova cut a promo about Johnny Gargano bitching yeah. about the establishment who put him in all those takeover matches instead of... Uh, Johnny wants to back up his words next week, and they're going to have a match. Is is uh, Dijakovic going to bring his wife? Is what I'm, is what I'm wondering here. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, he looked like he's out on the deck too. Apparently, from what I could tell, he's out on the deck. Oh, he was he was hanging on. Heck on the deck. Sure. Shout out to that guy. <laughs> so, the uh, the Lucha Ninjas were back, and they tried to kidnap El Hijo del Fantasma again. A little bit of swerve there, yeah. We all thought he was behind this guy at some point. That's right. And then we had our next match, Candice LeRae versus Casey Catanzaro with Johnny Gargano doing the most over-the-top ring announcing for Candice. Yeah, yeah. He is over-the-top, absolutely. So, That's been his whole gimmick lately, I guess. So Candice LeRae defeated Casey Catanzaro at four minutes via pin, busting out the old Super Dragon curb stomp. Yeah. Which Maro, I guess it's like the fucking twisted stepsister or some bullshit. Which fuck off. Just call it a curb stomp. <laughs> Super Dragon. Who doesn't love Super Dragon? Love that guy. That's right. Where'd he go? Is he still around? Uh, still alive? I'm sure he's everywhere. You <sighs> just don't. You don't see him. Yeah, yeah. I loved when he would just you know beat up fans for no reason. It's always good. So, but um, like that. what did you think about Candice's little match here with Casey? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's the whole deal put Candice over because they're pushing Johnny and Candice as this uh, mega heel type of couple. And you got to have Candice just beating the shit out of people like Can- Casey 
who I'm a big fan of, fan of Casey's potential. But at this point, you might as well have her have somebody lose to uh, Kansler, Ray. Right? So why not? Yeah, I thought it was a fine little outing overall, and obviously the win was to establish the quote unquote new Candice LeRae. The new super couple here go go gonna go up against uh, Killer Cross and whoever's with him, I suppose. That's Carrion Cross, Steve. It's not Killer. Carrion Cross. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Carrion. Well, at least they ain't call him a Killer Carrion Cross. Yeah. Triple K, it wouldn't have been too good, right? Like when Jim Cornette wanted to call Kenny King like Killer Kenny King in ROH. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Jim Cornette with a racial reference. How about that? That's right. Uh, Damian yeah. Priest said he was going to win the North American title tonight. Yeah, good luck. This led to what I can only describe as a very wacky Matt Riddle segment with Timothy Thatcher. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, you had Byron Saxton coming out, the host of Game Show segments, which we all know Timothy Thatcher excels on sports entertainment segments with uh, newlywed game type of deals. And uh, when I was watching this, I commented that when Larry Zonka asked me what I thought of NXT, I would just comment, bro. And that'd be it. Yeah, it's like, I kind of laughed a couple times, but like, I didn't find it overly funny. As Steve said, they were playing a version of the Newlyway game. It was the Newly Bro Show. Tim Thatcher just looked absolutely dumbfounded and confused the whole time. Like, what <laughs> the fuck am I doing here? Like, what did I sign up for here? <laughs> They did all kind of fucking questions. We got wacky answers. And then Imperium arrived, which was Barthel and Eichner, and they uh, beat the shit out of Matt Riddle and hit the European bomb on him and posed with the tag titles. So that'll at least be a good match when we get it. So, yeah, it eventually led to a point, eventually. I mean, that's the best way thing we can say about it. It did lead to a point, which is a future tag team title contender. You know, I know they're not booking this show for me, but I much would have rather saw Matt Riddle and Tim Thatcher kill a couple geeks in two minutes and then Imperium attack them. Yeah, yeah. But we got to have the sports entertainment layers on because uh, that's good shit, pal. There you go. Yeah. Adam Cole hypes his title match next week against the Velveteen Dream. <laughs> oh. Oh, man, the Velveteen Dream. Can we even, can we even talk about that at this point? Sure. This guy? Now, I mean, <laughs> there are certain allegations out there about that fella. Well, explain them if the people don't know about it, Steve. Not everybody reads the interweb. If you, if you listen to the show, you know about the allegations, about how there's been some speculation about him sending some pictures and some whatnot to uh, some underage folks. And that's that was a whole deal on Twitter, and uh, you know it's not been followed up on at this point, but uh, doesn't look good for a good friend, Mister Velveteen Dream. No, obviously not good to come out right when he's about to get a title shot either. Yeah, a title shot that he should have gotten like a fucking month ago, right? I guess. You know, that's the thing I'm saying. If only they had had that match a month ago, he could have avoid all this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Now it's uh, now it's looking like oh boy, yeah, it's it's not looking good for the guy, and I, I I hope that everything works out okay for him. I hope that I hope he's not a pervert. He, I hope he's not an asshole. I hope he's not like you know, you know that. But we gotta wait and see. But yeah. you know WWE, you know the WWE likes to do the worst thing possible. So they might put title on guy who knows he's a pervert. That's what they could do. Who the hell knows? With That's this the kind of thing anymore. they like to do. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, who knows? I mean, you might th- you might think, oh, they should fire him, but then they make him a champion. Well, but I don't know whether he's guilty or not. I can't even say. Yeah. Obviously, the the accusations did not come out at a good time for Young Velveteen Dream. All I can say is, I mean, honestly, all I can say about the guy, and we've talked about this before on this, on this show, is that since he's come back, he's not been particularly impressive. He's not been good at all. No, he hasn't been. I mean, he's had some bad matches. His promos haven't really hit him. I mean, I've been telling people for months how he's a goddamn heel, the way he's wearing tights and whatnot. You try to tell me he's baby face. I didn't see it. But, uh, you know. I told you they are putting him as a baby face. I didn't tell That's... you he is. They think he's a baby face. <laughs> yeah, Just like they think Charlotte's a fucking baby way. face. <laughs> But nobody, yeah, oh yeah, like Charlotte's a baby face, exactly, which we'll, we'll get to her pretty soon, I'm sure, but uh, yeah, to me, the whole, 
Yeah, ever since, like the past few months, Velveteen Dream has just not been very good. So, honestly, the right results for next week's match would be for Adam Cole to kick his ass, quite frankly. Uh, I do not disagree at all. Unless Adam Cole's going to go to AEW, so. <laughs> I don't know when his contract comes up, so I couldn't tell you. So, speaking of uh, Charlotte and the Lady Big Dog, we had Charlotte versus Mia Yim up next. Yeah, Charlotte defeated Mia Yim ten forty five via submission with the figure eight. Steve thought they had a good and competitive match. They had the nice little backstory that played into the build, and uh, you know we knew Charlotte wasn't losing, nor should she right now. And at the end of the day, I thought this was exactly what it needed to be a good TV match. It was fine, no complaints at all. I mean, Mia Yim, a very very good wrestler, uh, perfectly good for that job right there. And she did pretty well. And it's going to lead into uh, Charlotte versus Io Shirai at some point. That's right, because Io Shirai arrived post-match, and apparently that match is happening next week. Feeling a little bit of pressure there, I guess. I think so. <laughs> Feeling a little bit of pressure. It's like, oh, we better put something on. So there you go. Your good personal friend Dexter Loomis defeated Shane Thorne, uh, Thorne <laughs> up next in uh, three and a half minutes via submission. And uh, yeah, okay, it was a Dexter Loomis match. Fuck that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I, I don't, I know there are, there's a group of people that seem to like that guy and that's awesome. Your boy, I, Mark Radlich is a big fan. Apparently. Uh, well, I mean, he uh, was point. He said he likes them. Well, he said he likes weird things. Apparently like Kane Velasquez and, uh, Matt Taven and uh, yeah, uh, Matt, he likes Matt Taven. He was, a, he was a fan during the title run for a, for a big part of it. But I think he, uh, the bloom went off the rose. So, we're gonna. I mean, I, 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 I just don't know. But uh, yeah, Dexter Lumis is not, that's channel changer material for me. I'm sorry. If I see him on my screen, I will change the channel. You know, it's not fu- Yeah, you know, it's funny. Speaking about tape, and I've been doing uh digging in. The, I've been doing uh for everybody that hasn't quite picked up on it yet. I've been doing retro ROH TV reviews because I was kind of looking in my archive of stuff and um realized that uh on the site as a whole. And in my archive, there are no ROH 2012 TV reviews on 411 at all. So during the whole pandemic, I had no idea what they were doing in 2012. I couldn't tell you. Uh, Jim, Corn- no idea. Jim Cornette was the authority figure. Kevin Steen was on his road to beating Davey Richards for the title. Oh, okay. I kind of do remember yeah. that. Okay. World's Greatest Tag Team was around. But during this time, it's really interesting. Um, oh, God. I just also remember fucking Mike Mondo. Is there? Uh. God. Well, you know, Jim Cornette liked them. I know. Yeah. But anyway, what's interesting is uh, is you see some of the enhancement guys they were using at times. Yeah. And, like, I was sitting there, and, like, there was a match, and it was uh, Rhino defeating a young Vin- Vincent Marsiglia, who is uh, the uh, wacky balloon guy now with his stable in ROH, who turned on yeah. Matt Taven. And then uh, there's been a lot of uh, three or four I've seen Matt Taven matches. From well, back in the go. day, prior to when he became the young prospect, a top prospect winner. So, kind of interesting to see some of that. But yeah, that's a. If you haven't picked up on it, those reviews are going to be running. I'm going to get, try to go through the entire 2012 year just because I never did it and need something to do. You know, I've been keeping an eye on some of the best of the RH has been doing lately on television. And I saw they had one on Matt Taven like two weeks ago. And I was kind of thinking, like, Okay, who ha- they're doing Matt Taven. It's like, where can they, they go next after Matt Taven? Because I I thought Matt Taven was about as far low as they could go. And then next week they had Flip Gordon. How dare you, Steve? And I was just like, you know, what the fuck? Flip Gordon is a good American man, Steve, that defended our country. How dare you? He also thinks the earth is flat. Okay, well, he does have that going against him. I'll give you that. And I think one of the matches they featured was him and Bully Ray. So why the fuck would I watch that? Well, this is true. <laughs> okay. When one of your top yeah, matches you, against you're, Bully you're Ray? You're kind why of winning gonna, me over there. I'll give you. Why that. am I gonna watch that bullshit? Fuck that. Jesus Christ. All right. So I mean, and bless Sinclair for paying these people. Is all I can yeah. say. So Finn Balor's gonna be back next week and call out his attack attacker. So. Well, that's wonderful. Who do you think attacked them? Uh, I maybe it's Killer Cross again. Well, we did see the Imperium assholes this week, so I mean, possibly it's a tease yeah. for you know maybe probably because they're still Jesus. hoping to do that Balor Walter. If match. Walter can ever get to America at some point, maybe the, I don't know where. I'm sure, Walter? Walter can just like chop the walls down and leave when he wants to. Yeah, he probably could. <laughs> if anybody can get over here, it's probably Walter. <laughs> so we went back to the cruiserweight uh, tournament. Steve 
had Drake Maverick defeating Tony Nese in 10 minutes. Yeah. Picking up the big win for Drake Maverick, Steve, to stay alive. Yeah. And uh, what did you think of our match? Stay alive. Staying alive. Ha, ha, ha. Staying alive. You know, you had the build to this match, too, where Tony Nese was not – he was not really feeling the comeback story. He wasn't really feeling sorry for for Drake Maverick. And we probably shouldn't feel sorry for Drake, for Drake Maverick because if he's winning matches in this thing, he's probably not actually fired. So it feels like to me this whole this whole thing with him being fired is a bunch of bullshit, is what I'm what I what I'm getting out of this situation. I mean, maybe you think I'm wrong, but uh, from what I can tell, if they're putting this guy over to anybody at this point, he's probably not actually fired, and his whole firing is a whole angle. And if I was actually fired by these people, I would be pretty pissed off about it. Well, I mean, I, I'm not saying you're wrong. All I know is, according to the reports I've read, he is not rehired. But again. How often does WWE change their mind? Uh huh. So we'll see. I'm just saying, if I was one of these guys like Zack Ryder or Heath Slater sitting there watching this asshole Drake Maverick, I would be not. I would not be very happy about it. Fucking scab crossing the line, man. That's right. <laughs> exactly. That's why you wonder why wrestling will never have a union. It's guys like Drake Maverick. That's so, why, right there. I'm telling you. You know, and you'll, people get mad, but it's true. So, what do you think of the match, Steve? It was fine. It was all right. <laughs> it was a perfectly fine wrestling match. I have no complaints about Drake Maverick as a worker. And, uh, you know, Nice was on his game, and I thought it was perfectly decent. Yeah, I agree. I thought it was a perfectly solid match, and we'll see it where it goes. So next week, Steve, it looks like they are stacking things up. Adam Cole yeah. defending against Velveteen Dream. Charlotte well, defending Cole against Io Shirai. And Io better win. No, uh, I like Io. What can I say? I want Io to win, but she isn't winning. I hope no, Cole she's not wins win. <laughs> because I hope that God Cole wins because I, I don't see Velveteen Dream being a good NXT champion right now. Even with, the, yeah, I mean, even without the whole uh, speculation and whatnot, I would not see him as a good NXT champion. In spite, you know, even without, the, even with that whole stuff out of the picture, I would not see him as a good NXT champion because what I've seen from him lately has been, particularly great and i hope that they don't try to go too long because as we've seen in the empty arena setting his work is we know adam cole likes to go long so that could be a problem <laughs> well that's because sean michaels agents his matches so ah <sighs> god damn it you remember fucking yeah don't get me uh, i almost got started don't get me started all right so next week carrying cross will appear finn balor will address his attack on him and we also get johnny gargano in action versus dominic dajakovic well, I mean, and the, the, that's another Shawn Michaels agent in the match, probably, right? Yep. So we'll get a lot of good facial expressions and some uh, solid near frost. Main event of the evening was the North American Heavyweight Champion, Steve. I know your close personal friend, Keith Lee, defending yes. against Damian Priest. He is my close personal friend, that's right. Your boy, Keith Lee, picked up the big win, 11-14 via pin, Steve. I thought they had a good main event. They had the little backstory built into it where... You know, Damian Priest had attacked him with the nightstick. He tried to use the nightstick during this match. Keith Lee said, get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. Right. Fought it off. Collapsed the nightstick. Gave it to the referee. And then gave him the old double powerbomb to put this big asshole down. That's right. Good, good job by Keith Lee. Perfectly fine match. I continue to be completely pissed off about the fact that, uh, you know, and I'm sure that being a North American champion is a perfectly fine piece of business. I still say Keith Lee should have been the top contender for Adam Cole. That's why that's been my whole argument the whole time. I've been, I've not strayed from the argument, and if he was the top contender for that title right now, we we would not have the situation we have going on right now. Well, there you go. I mean, it's resulted in some fine matches with Keith Lee and you know Dijakovic and Damian Brace and all that, but I'm just saying, you push the guy to the moon, you give him the fucking NXT title, and we avoid all this nonsense with Velvet Junior. I'm just saying, yeah, and not even ter- and not even in terms of the possible allegations. We're just talking about Velveteen Dream not being any good on TV. Lately. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're not even talking about that. I mean, the guys. Where I mean, I'm just talking about how Velveteen Dream has been awful on television. So, you know, I mean, I think that I, I you know, ideally, if WrestleMania and everything had happened the way it, it was supposed to happen, I still think that M. Cole versus Keith Lee would, would have been bare main event. I don't disagree with you at all, dude. I think it would have been as well. So that is it for NXT, Steve, which means we have to do the head-to-head comparison for the week. Would you like to go first or do you want me to go first? 
I'm going to give it to the uh, all, all Elite Wrestling because you had two solid semifinal matches with Cody and Darby Allen and Lance Archer killing Dustin Rhodes. You had a kick-ass tag team match with uh, the best friends and Kip Sabian, Jimmy Havoc. You had Brody Lee killing <laughs> that poor bastard Marcus Stunt. You had a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in the show. You had uh, Tony Schiavone, Chris Jericho, and uh, you know Dr. Britt Breaker throwing Tony under the bus. Just a lot of good entertainment, including Vicky Guerrero getting a new catchphrase over. Just a lot of good stuff on the show this week. Next, he had a few decent moments, but I don't think it really held up in comparison. Fair enough. See, you, you brought up the Marco thing, and I was making me think, obviously, they're going live next week. They're going to have more talent, and they're going to be building to the pay-per-view. Are you thinking, I think maybe for the pay-per-view, are we looking possibly a six-man Lucha? Um, the, um, well, not Lucha, I was going to say Lucha Source, but the Jurassic Express yeah. and uh, Dark Order. Maybe a little trios match on that pay-per-view. If the, yeah, if Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy can come in, that would make perfect sense. Why not? You know, yeah, put them against uh, the, put them against uh, Stu Grayson and the Evil Uno and, and Mr. Brody, Brody Lee. Yeah. I think that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Because then you can also transition out of that to the Luchasaurus Big Brother coming for revenge. Yeah. Against the Exalted One, you could have a fucking yes. host daddy match right there. There you go. Yes, I, that would be perfect. Perfect in my book. It'll be interesting to see how they start building around the pay-per-view next week, and um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, overall, I thought I thought NXT had a good week. I thought it was an easy show to watch. I, I like the Cruiserweight Tournament continuing. It's doing a nice job. And they did a very nice job of building a strong lineup for next week. Because, you know, we, we, we joke about it. Oh, they're feeling some pressure, blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah, I mean, they probably are, but you can't lie. That's a strong lineup for next week. Got a Gargano match. Got the two title matches. That's good stuff. Um, I, I thought Dynamite was really good. It was also very enjoyable. Um, they're doing a great job of continuing the established angles. The squash matches they're running make sense with who they're booking them for. And I kind of feel like this week was the culmination of the, the of one story arc as they completed the TNT tournament to get to the finals. And now they're going to transition into that next story arc as they're building towards the pay-per-view. So next week they're live. They're going to have more roster members. In theory, we may have surprises. Yeah. And um, it's going to be really interesting to see how they really kick it into gear heading into the pay-per-view because, you know, you remember the beginning of the year, Dynamite was really knocking it out of the park as they built to the first pay-per-view of the year. And yeah. everything was going really well, so... I'm kind of expecting that again. I mean, I think the TV has been, at worst, it was like solid one or two weeks, but otherwise it's been good to really good. I think they've just been smartly booked. And, um, you know, Tony Khan, I mean, whatever you want to say about the guy, people like to make their Jacksonville Dixie jokes and all this shit. But um, I'm sorry. I don't know Dixie Carter ever sat down in a half an hour and booked out four weeks of TV that came out this fucking well. Yeah, I mean, I I gotta give the guy credit. I mean, you know, as far as you know, as far as people want to talk smack about him being you know Jacksonville Dixie or whatever, it seems like you know, and it happened like around the tour once the turn to twenty twenty, you know, the they kind of came to a kind of a bad ending at twenty nineteen, and that's kind of when Tony kind of started taking the chains more, started doing, making some more creative decisions. And it feels like it feels like things have been better since then. Steve, we have a new match announced for Dynamite next week. By the way, all right, Cody versus the returning Joey Janela. Oh boy! I was well, you know, if all the returns I wanted to see on the show, obviously Joey, Joey Janela was uh, somewhere on the list. There you go. He was somewhere on that list. Yeah. But yeah, I don't I'm, know where he was on the list, but he's on, he was on the list somewhere. I'm going to give AEW the nod as well. I think that they're doing just really good streamlined programming, and they're doing it with more handicaps as well. You know? Yeah, because you got to consider the, the whole NXT roster lives in Orlando. So. They're all there. Yeah. So Along with 55 other people that could job to fucking uh, Jinder Mahal, but they won't. There you go. So, Steve, that is going to wrap us up for this part of the show. What are you, uh, what are you going to be writing this week? What's coming up? I have no idea what I'm going to be writing this week, to be honest with you. I'm just, I'm, be, I'm being honest with you. It's a total shoot. I don't know what I'm going to be writing. Um, 
you know, you can always, I mean, you can always hit me up on thechairshot.com. I don't know if, uh, if anybody's got mad yet or not, but I've, uh, started doing some news from, from Cook's Corners columns over there. Saw that you betrayed me, Steve. That's right. Well, I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard any <laughs> lawsuits or anything yet, but, uh, well, you told me they didn't want that shit. You I, me I'm shit, fucking so, with you. you know. Yeah, exactly. So if they want, if other people want it, I'll give it to them. So I'm, I give the people what they want to see. That's what the, my whole thing I'm doing right now. I give the people what they want. My root most recent columns, uh, over on, I mean, goddamn, 411 this week, I had the top seven Triple H matches. That's pretty popular. People like that. There you go. And we had the botch column as well, so people like that as well. The, the top seven Triple H, the, yeah, it's, it's Triple H moments, not really matches, but uh, I know we'll be talking about Triple H pretty soon on the thing. And uh, I got the, you know, the guy he does have a lot of good stuff. Oh, he we does. Kind of, yeah, I mean, the kind of got ignored uh, on the various Triple H anniversary celebrations. <laughs> but, I mean, the guy had a lot of good stuff, and especially. And, you know, the, one of the shows we're watching for an upcoming podcast involves a match with Triple H and with Mick Foley. And, man, did, you know, anytime Triple H and Mick Foley got together, it was fucking, fucking magic, right? That was good business. When they they were, were man, those guys were fucking great together, weren't they? All the time. I mean, they had the first run in 97 that, that uh, got Triple H up to a certain level. And then they met up again in late 99, 2000, got Triple H up to May event level. And <laughs> it's fucking fantastic. Good stuff. It really is. So, yeah, we're going to obviously we're continuing on with a lot of kind of retro looks with uh, various guests like Jerome joins me to do Dark Side of the Ring. Last weekend, Kevin joined me. We looked back and did Ultima Lucha 1, Steve. Oh, gosh almighty. That was... And that was with a Vampiro and Pentagon Jr. Yep. Sarah Miedo match. Yep. That's the main thing that I remember because that 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 stole that show from my well from what I can recall. Vampiro almost died. And, they went yeah. crazy. They were they went crazy. It's fucking fantastic. So, yeah. but yeah, we we looked back on that, and then I'll give you guys a quick preview for this Sunday. Steve Cook and I went retro, and I've put together Steve a show. We're doing a collection. Retro Reviews, NWA Clash of the Champions 1, 2, and 3. Yeah. Sunday, um, probably Sunday afternoon-ish sometime, that will be uploaded for you guys. Uh, Steve Cook and I break down those events, and that's a a little project I think we're going to try to go through because Steve wanted to look back on Clash of the Champions, and I've had no problem with that because that's a good time. And uh, so, yeah, we'll be doing that, and I'll probably pair the... um, Dr. D, David Schultz thing, uh, that'll be coming up on one of the future shows that uh, aired this week on the Dark Side of the Ring. So oh. we'll have that coming up. But um, David Schultz, one of the great forgotten promos of all time. There you go. So again, he like... just have a lot of great interviews. He did. I guess. He did. I thought so. I honestly don't remember. I enjoyed him. <laughs> but again, guys, I, I want to remind you, we're, we're having fun doing a lot of retro stuff between uh, me, Steve, and Kevin. Um, we are taking recommendations. Like I said, if it's for Steve, you have to keep it to WWE Network or free on YouTube or Amazon Prime or Netflix. So Kevin has more money than I, than I do. Well, no, it's saying. just <laughs> no because like Kevin has New Japan World. So if like someone oh, wants okay. a New Japan, like a, a, an older New Japan show, Kevin and I can do it. Ah, but like you know, I'm t- I'm saying if they want you to specifically to do something, they have to stick to that. But I think Steve and I we have a plan. We're to do a lot of Clash of the Champions probably coming up. And I believe, Steve, yeah, this weekend we're also going to talk, uh, We're gonna, you mentioned it, we're going to look back on Canadian Stampede and record. Yeah, that one of the, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the university recognized greatest uh, WF pay-per-views of all time. That's right. So that'll be a good time. So uh, I want to thank Steve for his time. We had a good time talking to you guys as always. I want to thank everybody. Like I said, just um, we appreciate your support. But stay tuned because the show is not over. Kevin Pantoja is going to join me as we look back at the very first NXT TakeOver, The Arrival Show. All right, welcome back, and we are going to hit up another retro review. I know people have been really enjoying those, and I decided this time we were going to look back on some NXT, and I know you're thinking that NXT is not exactly old enough to do retro review stuff for, but 
I decided it is, and since I'm doing an NXT retro review, I figured there was nobody better to bring back on than Kevin Panto. Uh, Kevin, how are you, sir? I'm doing pretty well. Just came back from a 2020 live NXT show. Um, it was a blast as always. And uh, you say you, you can't really, uh, NXT doesn't seem retro, but you think about it, it's been on the network already six or seven years or six years, I think. So retro enough for me. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is, is I think it's cool to look back because we, we talk about these takeovers <clears throat> and how pretty much every takeover is, if not a very good, at least a great show. And then some of them are just amazing. And um, so we go back to February 27th, 2014, NXT arrival, the first NXT takeover. And, um, you know, real quick for a lot of people that don't understand, like the developmental system of WWE underwent a lot of changes. Cause in the late 90s, you, you kind of didn't have a specific um, dedicated uh, developmental. You had a lot of guys being sent to Memphis to work. You eventually had the OVW relationship, which... Some people just gloss over, but, I mean, the ruthless aggression thing is kind of bringing back to the fact that, uh, you know, you look back on that era and you got Cena, you got Orton, you got Lesnar, um, I mean, Orton, and... Even, you go a little deeper, you get, like, Shelton Benjamin, and it wasn't a, I feel like it didn't produce, like, that deep of a talent pool, but it was very, like, the top heavy, that's insane to produce Brock, Cena, Orton, and Batista. Exactly, so you got those top tier stars out of that. And also during the OVW run, there was also a short run where they had Deep South Wrestling, and that mm-hmm. actually was on like um, it was like on like Mav TV for a while. I reviewed episodes of mm-hmm. that back in the day with a uh, fucking uh, like Terry Gordy's kid and young <laughs> Kofi Nahaja Kingston. Was it Miz? I think champion or something there for a little uh, bit. I don't remember. Like you had Jindrak there. Um, yeah, um, Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins were tagging and. You had a bunch of dudes that went through there, and I remember I um I reviewed a bunch of that, and there was also they did an extra show that went along with that. It was um called Learning the Ropes. It was kind of like a behind the scenes reality thing with the roster, Ooh. and I reviewed a bunch of that stuff just because it was on Mav TV, and I'm like, well, shit, it's WWE related. I'll I'll review it, and it was interesting back in the day, and you you kind of look back <laughs> on that stuff, and you know, MVP went through there at one point. A lot of people and. Yeah, you um, Christ, the beginning of, of uh, Brodus Clay, Tyrus's career. He, oh he yeah, was, oh, Christ, he was fucking horrendous. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they eventually shuttered all that, and then we got FCW and FCW. Um, obviously led into NXT. FCW had such a rough start though; it was in a shitty warehouse for like the first six months. These poor bastards didn't have a bathroom that worked. They, they had to yeah. go down to the fucking, like, fast food joints down the street to change and, um, like, go to the bathroom and shit. And then they were working in front of, like, 12 people sometimes. But then, you know, FCW eventually, Triple H gets the idea that if they're going to try to bring in people with names from the indies or sports stars, you can't do that in the middle of Kentucky for OVW, and you can't do that in a shitty warehouse in WCW. And that's when they ponied up and uh, they built the uh, Performance Center. And then the relationship with Full Sail University came shortly after that. My alma mater. That's right. That's right. Kev's a Full (laughs) Sail alma mater. I almost forgot that. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, I never got to actually visit the campus. I did online, but still. That's right. So so you get the NXT brand, and even before NXT made TV, you heard about, like, there was cool stuff going on. Like, William Regal was working with dudes. And mm-hmm. you, you heard about, like, oh, the John Moxley they brought in from CZW. That fucker will never make it. He's a deathmatch yeah. guy. <laughs> Seth Raw or Tyler Black is a flippy dude with no body. And, you know, and just. I remember, uh, I. I... Just, you know, just kind of on the topic of Seth Rollins, I was at his final ROH show. I don't know if it was his final show, but it was when he dropped the title to Roderick Strong. And there's just so many you sold out chants and people were in the crowd. I just heard murmurs of like, he'll never make it there. He can't talk. And obviously that didn't happen. Yeah. So it's really funny when you look back at the history of WWE developmental. But anyway, February 27, 2014, we're at Full Sail University. The network had just launched. And uh, we're getting into the first major live special. Mm-hmm. And it was NXT. And um, a lot of speculation on what this was going to be, Kev. Because it's like, 
is it just going to be developmental? Is it going to be a bunch of green guys? What exactly are we going to get here? And uh, we're going to talk about that. We started off with a match between two guys that were no strangers to each other on the independent scene. They had tons of matches in 2013. Sami Zayn and Cesaro kicking off this show, Kevin. Just real short before I get into your thoughts, I don't think you could have asked for a better way to open this show. Cesaro wins in just under 23 minutes. And Just what were you thinking about this overall? So uh, just to kind of put myself back in the situation of watching this live, because I did watch it live. I was so excited. You know, the network was such a cool thing for any wrestling fan, you know. And the fact that they announced this live special, I knew of Zayn and Cesaro from ROH days, but I hadn't really watched NXT at Full Sail much before this. It was WWE.com, and I didn't feel like, I didn't really like the website. I didn't want to go there and bother with all that. Um, But I had heard about the two out of three falls match in 2013 that many people called match of the year. Um, so I was really excited to see this. Great way to start the show. Sometimes you you know you hear thoughts that you want your opener to not do a little too much so that later matches don't have to follow such a high you know bar. Um, but in this case, it needed to stand out because it was the first thing that we were seeing, at least for kind of the general public of NXT, and they knocked it out of the park. This is they've had tons of great matches against each other and i do think this is their best work together ever it's that good yeah and i agree with your point on the opener thing because sometimes you don't want to kind of fuck the rest of the card but Mm -hmm. this was a big deal this was hey we're nxt we're not you know we're not a bunch of fucking scrubs down here Mm -hmm. and they fucking went on and like i said they knocked it out of the park anytime you can kick off any kind of show I don't care if it's TV, pay-per-view, network, if it's on a fucking phone. Anytime you can knock out a fucking match that's four stars and over to kick off a show, I'm going to be happy, right? And then, yeah. like, like you said, these guys, this was an upper-tier match of the year candidate. This is, I mean, I think, like, the average I've seen on this is, like, roughly four and a half. And I've seen people obviously go higher, so it's like, this is the kind of match you needed to kick us off. Like, we're fucking here, dude. Yeah, I went four and three quarter uh, on it. Um, it was my early pick for match of the year. Uh, probably my end, my 2014 match of the year was Zayn Neville at the end of the year. Um, but this was right up there, probably top five to end the year. It's just like every little thing that they did. Uh, to Sam, it, it reminded me because we haven't seen him wrestle in, I don't know, a year or so, how good Sami Zayn is. I know, you're right. And it's just, you, you look back on it too, because like Cesaro is, Cesaro is always so fucking good. And, and, and Sami yeah. is obviously great, but like you said, we just haven't seen Sami, so you almost kind of forget that Sami Zayn is an excellent professional wrestler and pretty much <laughs> yes. like everything he does. But you go back and you watch this match, and first of all, like I said, it's just under 23 minutes. It fucking flies by. Yes, I mean, it does, it does not... Watching. You're ah, not yes. sitting there down to stretch going, all right, go home, guys. I mean, you're just into it. And the finish is just fucking... It's off the chain, hitting big moves. Cesaro hits that big pop-up uppercut, and Sammy does the big fighting spirit kick out at one. And then he's quickly finished after that. And perfect example of, yes, it would have been great for Sammy to win this match, obviously. But it's mm. also a match that it's so fucking good and that he was over so huge as a baby face that he lost absolutely nothing here. You can lose a match and not lose anything. This isn't Brock killing Ricochet in 90 seconds. No. To where Ricochet literally got nothing. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is a dude that's like... It's like everybody knew Cesaro was a dude because he's, he's on the main roster and everything. But you see this, and you're like, yeah, Cesaro's fucking great, but this Sammy dude, like, if you didn't know Sammy Zayn El Generico, you go in and you see this, and you're like, holy shit. Like, is, mm-hmm. is, is this was... what everybody in NXT's like? <laughs> yeah, it sets a high bar, and, you know, Sammy is a guy who, we've seen him, at least recently, you know, before his uh, injury or whatever's going on with him, he was working as a heel, and he does good with that, but he's... Just such a good baby face. Like, he takes a beating almost better than anybody. Cesaro destroys him in this match. And like you said, he loses nothing. He looks incredible fighting behind, you know, fighting from beneath. And at the end of the day, his whole thing was that he wanted that respect, kind of. And Cesaro gave, showed him that respect at the end. 
Yeah, exactly. So again, you couldn't ask for a better way to kick off a show. And um, I did. I love that match. Going back to rewatch it, like I remembered, like yeah, it was like Sammy and Cesaro is like pretty a pretty great match. And then yeah. I watched it back, and I'm like, yeah, it's actually even a little better than I remembered. So it's like shit, man. Yeah. It's like, oh god, yeah, you can't ask for a better thing. So unfortunately, you had the the card comes down a little bit from there. Uh, we, uh, a lot yeah, of it. <laughs> we have uh, C.J. Parker and Mojo Rawley. And for those of you that might not remember, C.J. Parker was a horrible character. He was like a hippie environmentalist. And he eventually left NXT because he realized with all the indie guys coming in that he was never going to get a push. Went to the New Japan Dojo, and he is now Juice Robinson, who is pretty fucking great in his own right. Yeah, I never would have. When he went to New Japan, I remember everyone saying, I don't, this is not going to work. This guy's lame. And to be honest, his first few, you know, his first months, few months at in New Japan were pretty, you know, like you can't really remember what happened there. But then he started gaining traction and be showing that he's also, like Sami Zayn, a fantastic babyface. And he's consistently one of my favorite people to watch in New Japan now. And the thing with the thing with him going to New Japan is like, yeah, those early months, I, I, I described him several times. He was such a square peg in a round hole. Mm-hmm. He just he had to be so deprogrammed from the style that he knew. And yep. once he did and he got into that new Japan style and as you mentioned he slowly started getting over and getting over and then we'd start getting some promo work from him. It's like holy shit this dude can talk a little bit. And then yeah. he got a lot better and then he had those early title matches with Goto and Naito. And it's like, mm-hmm. holy shit, it's like, this this dude has some fucking chops. It's like, he might be a fucking star for them. And he has become a star for them. It's one of my favorite long-term, like, booking decisions that New Japan has made. Watching him go from the guy who came in, like, kind of as a joke, like, nobody's going to take him seriously, to building his way up, to getting some tag wins, to the title matches with, like you said, Goto and stuff. Uh, his G1 win over Kenny Omega that shocked the world was great. And then they had the U.S. title match after that. His title win against Jay White. Um, pretty much everything that he does is just a lot of fun. I wish they would have run with him and Finn, uh, David Finley as tag champs a little longer or a lot longer, but... Yeah, he's 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 great. He really is. And then we have Mojo Rawley, who has been Mojo Rawley. Uh, Pretty I mean, much. Mojo is obviously a dude with an athletic background and everything, and I'm sure Mojo's a really nice guy. But like, <laughs> I mean, if we're being honest, Mojo Rawley is not a good professional wrestler. He's and this was back in the you know the um, stay hyped Mojo days and yeah they had a really short match it was like three minutes it was it was not good you can call it your cooldown after the opener and Mojo won and um I mean even back then despite the fact that C J Parker wasn't any good I liked him a lot more than Mojo Raleigh <laughs> yeah to be fair because it, it felt like C J had granted these guys weren't doing anything crazy. Um, but it definitely felt like CJ had the basics down better. Um, Mojo felt like he was, I know it's kind of cliche to say because he's, you know, the get hype guy, but he was, seemed like he was running on like, all energy and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a like two or three minute match just designed to try to get Mojo over. Um, that's really all it was. Yeah, I just um, never liked Mojo, but it is fascinating. You look back, we're in 2014 and then, you go to 2020 and Juice Robinson is a, you know, a former U.S. champion. He's a former tag team champion. He's been in the Dome several times. And, mm-hmm. I mean, again, if you would have told somebody back then, C.J. Parker's going to have major matches in the Tokyo Dome and for, like, three years straight, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of my favorite things to do when doing retro reviews. I do like weekly retro reviews on my Patreon and it's fun to look at what it's like, not too far away. Like how those people are doing now. Like you said, juice is a major player in new Japan and Mojo's still kind of Mojo Raleigh. Um, <clears throat> just as an example, this week I've been doing a ring of honor review from 2007 and there's a tag title match. And two of the participants are Naruki Do and Davy Richards. 
But then the other two participants are Roderick Strong and Shingo Takagi, two of the best like <laughs> pro wrestlers in the world 13 years later. And that's so interesting to look back on. Yeah. Miruki Doi can still fucking go, though, brother. Let me tell you that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, From what I've seen in Dragon D- Gate. Davey's <laughs> pretending to be a doctor again, I guess. So. <laughs> Who the hell knows what's going on? <laughs> uh, so, next up, we have the NXT Tag Team Championship. The Ascension defending against, and this is no joke, Too Cool. They had brought in yeah. Too Cool, and ironically enough, Scott Taylor is still around as a trainer in uh, NXT these days. Unfortunately, Brian Christopher no longer with us. Um, yeah. you know, obviously, they were brought in to get a pop from the crowd, to get a, a little nostalgia going for the uh, network viewers, and to give the Ascension a win over a name. And the Ascension were a team that... They, it's weird. They were never great, but they weren't exactly horrible either. And I find I, they were like so sabotaged when they got called up to the main roster. Yeah. And I mean, it was so hard to come back from that. They were made geeks from day one, but they were tag team champions in NXT. They had a run here. They beat too cool at a little under seven minutes. Kev, what did you think of this one? Uh, it's, I, I didn't really like it. Um, I'll get into uh, a little more, but I did want to say on the Ascension, I don't think, like you said, they weren't terrible, but they also weren't that good. I think they could have done a little better on the main roster. Um, I don't think they would have, you know, set the world on fire, but it did not help immediately getting like shit on by all the veteran tag teams. Um, as for this match itself, it, I don't think it needed to be six and a half minutes. It's a case where I get it. The nostalgia pop is there too. Cool. Yeah, it's fun. But the Ascension, considering who they were, the dominant tag team champions, they should have just run right through too. Cool. Give it like two or three minutes. Get in, get out. Let us know. Okay. Too cool. Wasn't a huge threat, but this, this tag team, the Ascension, maybe they are, you come away from watching this. Like they kind of struggled to beat a team that's, 15 years past their prime so that you know i don't think it worked for what it should have been i agree it was too too long and i just they were building the ascension as this like for lack of a better word because i hate to use the comparison they were supposed to be like a road warrior-esque dominating bruiser tag team Mm-hmm. And again, I'm not saying the Ascension in anywhere where the Road Warriors plays, but it's no, just, I get you. in 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 style. That's what they were supposed to be. And during this match, they never really were. They did some stuff. Too cool. Got their stuff in. They had this like weird run towards the end where they were like the Ascension was just selling like way too much for two smaller, older guys. To where they were running through like younger, super athletic guys with ease during the time, and it just it felt off. And again, like, well, hey there, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got a message. Uh, one second. Okay. But yeah, for me, it's just that um, it, too cool didn't have like, for I guess for lack of a better comparison as well during this time, they're, they're not like legendary team like the Rock and Roll Express. And, like, you can buy the Rock and Roll Express doing a little bit here in 2019-2020 to where it was too cool against the Ascension. It just didn't come off well. Felt a little too long. And as Kevin said, you go two, maybe three minutes. Too cool gets a couple key spots, and the Ascension murders them. We move on. Yeah, agreed. Um, I did get, uh, speaking of Scotty Tuhati still being a uh, trainer at NXT, I forgot about that. And I was looking up before I went to this NXT live event, who was going to be there. And I saw him tweet that he was going to be there. And I was like, it's got to do how do you work in this show? Like what's happening? And then I realized, Oh wait, he does work, you know, as a producer. So I realized it's probably him and, uh, Albert back there, and I thought about him and when Albert was the hip hop hippo with him. So that's just where my mind I went. Know. They're backstage working these shows. I know they're fucking like running NXT backstage. <laughs> <laughs> the hip hop hippo and fucking Scotty Too Hot are molding the next generation. Who would have bet on that's that an abs- one? <laughs> 
That's what I was going to say. That's an absolute case of never would have saw that coming. That's more far fetched than Juice Robinson working in Tokyo, though. It's like it, it's like you tell somebody that William Regal is one day going to do commentary and guide and be the GM of a developmental brand. You're like, yes, I can see that. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Fucking Lord Stephen Regal was a great professional wrestler. But yeah, it it is amazing when you look at stuff like that and who trains because like for years like Shawn Michaels didn't want to really get into the NXT thing because he did the wrestling school a little bit even though he yeah. was never really involved with the wrestling school all that much because he was mm-hmm. solving problems at that time but he felt he was one of those guys that like he always talked about how well you know great hockey players don't always great make hockey coaches and stuff like that mm-hmm. he didn't know if he'd be any good and then he ends up he really fucking enjoys it and he seems to be doing a pretty good job so but then on the other end of the spectrum again you got Sky too hot and Albert and it's like it, it feels so weird, but then again, you have Regal who you buy. Norman Smiley is a guy you can believe training people. Yeah, but the, yeah, the, you you killed me with the hip hop hippo <laughs> reference. <so. laughs> it's one of those things where you know, like you were saying, great uh, hockey players or just generally great players often in sports don't make great coaches. You know, or you know, even managers. You know, Michael Jordan's had his issues as. Uh, president or whatever, but then you have players who rode the bench for years who turn out to be good coaches. I think it's like maybe because they weren't so focused on being the top star, they learned a fair amount. You know, so I think that's why they work in these positions. It, yeah, exactly. Because it's like you look at some some agents that like people revered, like you know, Arn Anderson comes to mind. Like Arn was like seen as agent. You yeah. know, and like Arn was never the guy, but everybody fucking loved Arn. Because of yep. what he was, and it's just like the mind for the business. So, yeah, it's a, mm-hmm. it's fucking wild when you look at uh, how things shake out. Yeah. So we have uh, the NXT Women's Championship match next up, and this was the signal of the turnaround for the women's stuff because mm-hmm. this was a professional w- wrestling match with two women, Paige the Champion facing off with Emma. Um, they were not referred to as divas here. Yeah, I think there's only one mention when Stephanie, I think, called them the Divas of the Future, but that's it. Other than that, it's not at all mentioned. Yeah, this was when they were starting to turn things around. So we get this match here, and Paige ends up retaining the championship just under 13 minutes. Um, I found this to be, first of all, it's a really enjoyable wrestling match. It's really good. And again, it's a match that started signaling the turnaround to where we've kind of become now because, you know, they started calling the matches women's division matches. Mm -hmm. We weren't, you know, it wasn't fucking hair mares and all this shit all the time. (laughs) You know, we were actually getting composed wrestling matches that got time on a major show. And Mm -hmm. again, it's, it's really good. And obviously you look back on things now, it's kind of, it's sad looking back at this match, and I'll get your thoughts obviously in a minute, but you have Emma who did not work out well when she went to <coughs> went to the main roster, kind of a um, <sighs> dancing Homer goes to Capital City deal with her. Yeah, very much an, uh, an Adam Rose situation where the gimmick got way over at NXT and it didn't translate well. Yeah, and then Paige obviously, unfortunately, had her career ended. Um, yeah, you know, her neck issues. I mean, she had the brief comeback, and then it ended again. And um, yeah, and she, yeah, she had some personal problems when she was dating Del Rio and stuff. And thankfully, all that seems to be past her. But yeah. unfortunately, uh, very unfortunate, obviously, that her career ended so young because she got into wrestling so young. And the, the only reason she wasn't on the main roster for a long time is because she was under twenty one. And they yeah. had the, the edict that nobody under 21 was going on the road because they didn't want them drinking and you can't run cars and shit like that. And yeah. So it took a long time for her to get there. But again, I really liked this match. Um, this was, you know, Emma had her moments in um, NXT and every once in a while on the main roster had a couple good outings and then she left. She did some indie, she did some ROH, and she's done some impact and... I tell you what, man, haven't been really impressed with any of her post WWE work. Really unfortunate. That's what I've been hearing. <clears throat> it's like she's a gorgeous woman, dude. She comes out, she looks like a star, she walks like a star, and then she gets in the ring, and then the bell rings. 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's never usually bad, Kev, but it's like, it's okay. Yeah, it just kind of exists. And when there's so many other women out there on the indies, you know, that haven't been signed yet that are still really good. I mean, just yeah. because you have an, a name, you can't go out there and just deliver okay all the time. So, but mm-hmm. yeah, really unfortunate. But anyway, I really enjoyed this match. thought it was really good. What did you think? Uh, it's the big, it's the step back up that the show needed after two matches that, you know, weren't very good. Um, it is definitely a, a big turning point for the division. Their championship match at the end of the tournament earlier in 2013, uh, I mean, the previous year in 2013 was also very good, but this was obviously on a bigger stage. Uh, like you said, really good match, very good back and forth stuff. Um, you could tell that they had very good chemistry together. There were some really standout uh, moments like, Emma's impressive powerbomb that got the better than Batista chance, which is kind of funny considering, you know, that was 2014 when Batista won the Royal Rumble and everybody was anti-Batista. And now we all love Batista again. Um, You know, that was cool. I liked how Paige hit the page turner. And when Emma kicked out, it felt like a big deal because it wasn't a case of overdoing uh, finisher kickouts. I do think that that's something that happens way too often nowadays. Um, but that was a case where she kicked out, and you could tell it was the first time anybody had done that. And then Paige did the PTO, which look, it's still, to the, like in my opinion, one of the best submissions that I've seen because there's really no way out of it of the PTO. Um, I would have liked maybe a little more build to her, like getting that move on, like after she failed the Paige Turner, maybe Emma makes a little comeback. But again, overall, very good. Obviously, it gets kind of forgetting about, forgotten about because. You know what Sasha and Bailey and Charlotte and Becky all did after, and Oscar and all the women of NXT going forward. Like this would not even make a probably a top ten, you know, women's match on Takeover. Um, but at the time, it was pretty amazing. Uh, still very good to this day. Yeah, and like you said, it, it, it will be slept on when you go back and you look at the women's division stuff because there have been so many great NXT women's matches from the names you mentioned. Mm-hmm. But again, it has to start somewhere. You know, it's like I was talking to somebody the other day on uh, Twitter because I was uh, I was watching the Deep Space Nine documentary Star Trek, and just mm-hmm. uh, it was really good. And someone's like, "Yeah, I think Deep Space Nine is my favorite." You know, Star Trek. And someone's like, "Oh, you yeah. can't shit on the original, and you can't shit on D." De- uh, can- <laughs> and then they're like, "Well, you can't shit on the next generation because if next generation doesn't succeed, you don't get Deep Space Nine." And that's a fair point to to kind of Tarantino back to this yeah. because you kind of can't forget this match because. This is where the the tone of how they presented the women started to change, and then yep. this started to where we start to to get into that really great string of stuff through 2014 and beyond. After this, and so it's it's very important. You kind of don't get there unless you take the first step, and that was it. So I kind of hope that like another reason we're talking about this show. I kind of hope that like this is a match that doesn't get forgotten. Agreed. And it's like you were saying, you know, it's a case of you don't get those other things without this. You know, say these two went out and shit the bed and they had a a match that sucked. Would that have made WWE or, you know, Triple H or NXT? Not saying they would have, but there's a chance that maybe they're like, well, maybe let's not put too much focus on this division. I can't see Triple H doing that because he seems to really appreciate the women's division. But in general, it's like you needed to deliver and they did deliver something very good. Yeah. I think if they would have went out there and totally <clears throat> shit the bed, like the next NXT women's match probably would have been like a five minute special. Mm-hmm. But thankfully, it didn't have to be that. And like, because they, again, they did deliver. So, again, an important um, point to go back on in NXT history, much like that opening match, because that opening match set the stage for kind of what the modern takeover shows are in terms yeah. of overall match quality. And it was like, if you went back in 2014 and you tell us all, listen, matches like this on TakeOver are going to be pretty much the fucking norm. You'd be yeah. like, oh, come on now. It's like, it, yeah. I don't think that's possible. And it, it kind of is. I mean, we get something close to, if not better than that, almost on every TakeOver. If you, When we did uh, our podcast on TakeOver Portland, I believe we both agreed that like Adam Cole, Tommaso Ciampa was the worst thing on the show, and I rated it like at three and a half, three and three quarters, you know, stars. Like it's still the worst thing on these shows are usually very, very good. Exactly. I mean, it's it, it's rare. I mean, it's rare that you dip below that gentleman's three unless you have something like 
you know, that Enzo Amori hair match where he never shaved his hair and non finishes. Yeah, more recently. <laughs> Oh, yeah, more recently they had, I believe, like Lars Sullivan a couple years ago. He wrestled Ono to start the show, and it was like a four-minute match or something. Or Riddle beat uh, Cash Ono like in five seconds. Um, so, yeah, that's really the only time that you get something that you're like, yeah, this didn't really work. Yeah, and speaking of that rare occasion, we had one here with Tyler Breeze facing off against <laughs> Xavier Woods, obviously. Tyler Breeze went on to tag with Fandango later on. He is now... Back as a singles in the cruiserweight division because Fandango unfortunately got hurt again. That poor bastard's had a rough run. He has. And, um, Xavier Woods was a dude who I I loved Xavier Woods when he was in TNA because he came in and had to replace um, Pac Man Jones on a pay per view because yep. Pac Man Jones wasn't allowed to work the match. And this dude comes in. Consequences Creed. Who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> and it's like he had a cool look and everything and he tags with truth and he fucking did really good on his first pay-per-view i was shocked how good he was lethal consequences was a lot yeah of fun. but he comes in and it's like he, he comes in and it's like you shouldn't be this good debuting on a pay-per-view it's like i don't yeah. care how what your background is but like he comes in and does really good he eventually gets signed by wwe Obviously now part of the new day, and unfortunately also he's out for a while with that Achilles injury, but he's a guy that just rose up the ranks, and the new days, I mean, I know there are some people that, I don't like the new day, they fucking throw pancakes, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's fine, Mm -hmm. but you can't argue that the new day is fucking over, and they made some really cool moments, they've had some great tag team matches, the Kofi Mania stuff, I mean, as a group they've done a lot of stuff, but... But back then, he was just Xavier Woods facing off with Tyler Breeze. And Kev, what the hell happened here? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, as maybe like 10 seconds after the bell rings, Rusev's music hits, and he comes out with Lana, uh, hair down Lana, so it's different than main roster Lana when he first got called up. Um, and then Rusev just absolutely wrecks the both of them. Um, and then, you know, this basically just done here to, to let you know that Rusev is a legitimate threat, although he doesn't even stay in NXT long. I think he's gone a month later, maybe. Um, so yeah, just the kind of a weird segment. Um, I do want to point out that I think it was, it's interesting to look back at this because knowing that Breeze and Xavier Woods are like best friends and they have all this stuff on up, up, down, down. Then you have the fact that Woods here came out to Brodus Clay's music. Um, this is when he was like Brutus Clay's partner, I guess, to replace Tenzai. <laughs> he, he's a, he seems to be a partner replacement kind of guy. Um, and it's just interesting to see that again, just how they, you know, over the past seven or, or years, six years, he went from this guy who was pretty unimportant to now. I think he's one of the most valuable people that the company has. Um, he's, you know, the fact that New Day is still as over as they are and successful, their longevity is almost unmatched. Like, they're insane. Um, he, he's constantly doing stuff with his up, up, down, down. I think he's super underrated. He always has been. When New Day first formed, everybody said, well, you know, Kofi's the guy who's been so good for so long. And then Biggie's the guy who feels like he could be a superstar. And Woods is just, and I never felt Woods was just there. Some people did, but Woods is fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, I would have liked to have seen this be an actual match. Uh, Breeze ended up, um, you know, I think at the next takeover, he's in a marquee match against Sami Zayn, so it's weird that he was used for this. Yeah, it was that, that, that was the weird thing, because it's like, Rusev comes out and just fucking murders these guys. And then it's like, <laughs> next, next, next time it's like Tyler Breeze is like, hey, I'm important again, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of, kind of uh, an odd segment. Not bad or anything, but like you said, it it comes off extra weird when you consider Breeze goes on to an important match, and then Rusev essentially has like no real NXT career in this yeah. era. So it's just like okay. Yeah, it it, it was yeah. Like I said, it, it maybe had he stuck around in NXT, but he's on the main roster by Mania. So, and uh, you know the funny thing about Breeze is he was on uh, Shane Strickland's podcast. Um, mm-hmm. fucking Swerve Scott, whatever. I still call him Shane Strickland. That's not... <laughs> but they were talking about um, just like his road in NXT and like all the things that didn't work and like they were like give us ideas and he'd give them ideas and then they were like well, we didn't get them. 
He's like, what the fuck do you mean you didn't get him? You know, it's like, so he talks about how he gets the character and then how they did that whole, um, the big series and stuff on them and how at the end he gets called up. And he said, he was told at the beginning, like, you know, yo, you know, blah, blah, blah. Someone's going to get called up and someone's going to get cut. And then like before they aired it, he thought he was definitely getting cut. Oh. And all that stuff. So, cause like he had been like teased so many times that he was gone. Yeah, but again, t- that's, Tyler's that's... a dude I like a lot, and I, I can't, I like. It sucks that Fandango's hurt, obviously, but I, I dig seeing him on like two hundred five live and stuff, and he's having some fun matches on NXT with like Jordan Devlin and stuff, and I, I mm-hmm. like him a lot, and I, I really dug the, uh, the original Tyler Breeze character because I, it was fun, and you know he was, he explained that he said like the early um, iteration of the gimmick was he was supposed to be so obsessed with his gimmick that he did like nothing in the ring. He would just go in there and like punch and kick. And then like, if he had to win, he would punch and kick and survive. And then he'd do something shitty and hit his finish. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Doesn't it? So, (laughs) but he, he just talked about how it grew and like how he came out with the mirror at first and triple H is like, yeah, it feels a little too old school. So they did the phone. And then like he said, two weeks later, the guys backstage were like, we can sync your phone up with the screen. And he was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know? no, he's a, it's a, if anybody wants to listen, it's a, the, uh, the swear podcast, I guess. And it's really good. Listen, he just talks about his entire time with, um, NXT and like him and woods tagged at one point, And they were like spending all this money. They didn't have on gear trying to get over as a team. And then like all their ideas would be shit on. And like, <laughs> It's yeah. just like such a rough road, but he's it's a good interview. He's it's a he's a good storyteller and really enjoyable. But yeah, it's amazing to see kind of where both guys are coming, like especially Woods because there's a dude with like a master's and a doctorate and he's fucking like killing his it, it on his uh video game channel. He's a good professional wrestler, he's part of a hugely overact. And yeah, you don't see yeah. like trios or big groups last a long time because like, you look at a lot of these Mexican groups, and, like, um, a lot of the guys in Mexico, they'll have these trios and, like, factions, and they break up rather quickly. There's, like, 18 different Ingobernable staples because of Rusha status. <laughs> but then, like, you look at, like, New Day, and New Day is just rolling. They're still around. They're still over. The only thing that I could lightly compare to New Day in terms of longevity and being over is uh, LIJ in Japan. Because, yeah. I mean... It's just, like, yeah, you have chaos and a lot of those guys have been together for a while and stuff like that, but, like, LIJ, the core unit, has been together for a long time, and then you added names, but they're still, like, the most over thing on the card almost all the time. Yeah, for and sure. It's and it's like you, Yeah, but, you know, um, I was thinking about it uh, <clears throat> the other day about how the Undisputed Era are, it's been about almost two years now that Strong joined them, so it's been two and a half or so, and they don't feel like they're, you know slowing down or anything but even so that's nowhere near new day and i think you know what the undisputed era done is impressive so what new day's done is even crazier yeah it is it really is it's gonna be interesting to see how long undisputed era lasts because every couple months there's there's the rumors of they're gonna get caught up or cole's getting caught up or you know you hear that and then like the next report is well, they don't want to take them off NXT because they don't want to lose them because they're such an important part of NXT, just not on TV, yeah. but as far as takeovers go. And especially when you're battling another company on Wednesday night, you don't want to take away, you know, c- conceivably your biggest group of stars. You know, mm-hmm. that would be a bad... And real quick, kind of... This is... I'm not sure when I'm going to run this, by the way, but just... uh. NXT and AEW from the past week because this is the seventh. Were you surprised, Kev, that after advertising the two cage matches, NXT didn't see a bigger bump than they did? Uh, I mean, not really. Um, I know that it's always better to advertise your stuff ahead of time, uh, you know, for ratings bumps. I just I don't really think that steel cage matches are the, a selling point. I feel like there hasn't been enough great ones. You know, with AEW's the Cody Wardlow one, at least that was, you know, you want to, you're interested to see how, uh, you know, AEW handles a cage match. I think WWE's given us too many lame ones yeah. uh, over history. Don't get me wrong, the ones on NXT were good. I, again, I haven't really loved either uh, Velveteen Dream Rider or Strong Match since Dream came back. 
um, good but not great. I thought that the cre- the finishes were creative to both Dakota Teague. It was very good. Um, but I just I don't think that that's like a major selling point or, you know, to get somebody to come in to watch a show because we have bad memories of those. Yeah, it, it's it's odd. I expected a little more of a bump because traditionally mm-hmm. cage matches have bump TV ratings. And in yeah. theory, you know, putting two of them on might have enticed more people to watch. And I just I thought it would be a little more. But yeah, and I kind of agree with you on Velveteen Dream stuff like he's. He's been like a little off to me since coming back. I mean, obviously, still yeah. charismatic and everything, and it's not like he's been totally shit in the bed. But like, I don't know, feels a little off. And then like, it looks like we're getting him and Cole, and it's like, okay, it's like you know, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna crown Dream, or is he gonna lose and move up? Or it kind of a weird yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense as the match because it is probably the biggest match that we haven't seen in NXT. Yeah especially with Johnny and Ciampa tied up with each other. Um, but it's just, yeah, I don't know if Dream is... He's super over, of course. I just I don't know if the time for him to be champions right now, but then again, you don't really want him to lose a big match because I feel like that'll hurt him, so I'm not sure where they go with this. That makes it interesting, though. It does, and I do appreciate that. And that's a kind of a weird way to segue into the main event, the NXT <laughs> Championship match, a ladder match. And again, there are people that may not have watched this show, so we are not kidding here. The champion is Bo Dallas. Yes, the B, the B team guy. Okay, because I know some people might not have watched this show. Facing yeah. off with Adrian Neville. And if you don't know who that is, that is Pac. Yeah. Okay, Adrian the Neville was... The funny thing is he was signed. Uh, he was um an impressive dude, did a lot of Dragon Gate. Really impressed, got signed. And when they signed him... At the time, they refused to sign Ricochet because they said, well, we already have Adrian Neville, Mm -hmm. which I I could understand stylistically. They were kind of the same guy, if you look at it that way. But it's so funny that they eventually did end up signing Ricochet and then Neville left. So it's it's weird how that all works out. But this was the, uh, the NXT Championship ladder match. It had been built up for a while. Bo was... Bo wasn't the best wrestler, but I think the best way to put him, Kev, is I thought he was really good in his heel role. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't watch a ton of NXT, like like I said, as it was happening um, <clears throat> at that point, but I did go back and see a lot of Bo Dallas and stuff, and I think he was so good at that character. Like, he completely believed in everything that he did. He had some great... Like, he's just so delusional. The fans are chanting, no more Bo, and he thinks they mean no K-N-O-W. Like, they want to know more about him. Um, <clears throat> a lot of his stuff after, you know, even after he lost, uh, you know, after this show, um, like, when he was uh, moving to the main roster and they did the gimmick where he was forced out of NXT and he doesn't want to leave, so he's getting, like, taken away by security and he's yelling and he's telling the fans to leave. And he's so funny at that role. <clears throat> and I wish we, you know, would have gotten more of it. Um, one suggestion that I always had is kind of off, uh, a little off topic, but for Bo Dallas when he was on the main roster and he was doing his whole Bo Leave uh, gimmick, I really wish that his finisher was a submission move, where as he holds you in it, he's telling you like, "Believe in yourself, don't go, don't give up." And I thought that'd be a really cool way to go with it. That would have been fun, but yeah, he was again like I didn't think Bo was a bad wrestler in any way, but like I thought gimmick wise he was really f- superior to his wrestling ability during this time cuz absolutely just really good heel stuff but the good news is you know th- this match is this is a quality main event for the show and uh we, real quick we did have sh- a rare Shawn Michaels appearing at the time ca- mm-hmm. bringing out the NXT championship because this was a ladder match and it's Shawn Michaels so you kind of have to bring in Shawn Michaels yeah so we had the big ladder match main event. It goes about 16 minutes. We have a new NXT champion in Adrian Neville. Kev, what did you think overall? Um, I thought it was a very good main event. Um, about on par, I think, for me with the Paige Emma match. Uh, obviously nothing groundbreaking, uh, nothing amazing. Um, I did like that it wasn't a match based around high spots. Uh, it was more of the, like... Not on the same level, obviously, but like the Triple H Rock Ladder match from SummerSlam 98, where it was more just built as, as a regular match rather than, you know, oh, who can do the most cool spots on a ladder, um, which I get with Bo Dallas. Like you said, he's not a bad wrestler, but 
he's not really going to wow you in a, in a situation like a ladder match. They kept it. They just worked a smart match. They had the, the right guy went over. It was what it needed to be to kind of get NXT into that next level because once Neville won the title, like I feel like things took off, you know? Definitely, because we got a lot of good stuff following that. Um, Had the Tyson Kidd run in NXT, which is slept so on. Good. He was yes. so good. I agree. And I, I love Tyson Kidd. He's, he's a good fucking dude. And he was so good during that time. And again, I just... That's why I like to look back on some of this stuff because I think people forget about certain things and I think the Tyson Kidd run in NXT gets really slept on. I hope people, if they hear about this and haven't watched it, go back and catch some of the TakeOver stuff. There's a a really great four-way they did. It was, it's, uh, it's so good. It's, it's Neville, Kid, Zane, and Tyler. Breeze, yeah. yeah. It's it's phenomenal. It's really great. And um, But yeah, it's a good run. I agree. Really good ladder match. I, I did like that. It, it was smart to work the style they did because Bo's not a spot guy. And it wouldn't yeah. have made sense for him to go, I'm going to go up to the top of the ladder and do a flippity-fuckity-doo. Because he yeah, never it's not in his that. character. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they, they did kind of reserve the stuff. It was a very, it, as you said, it was like a Sean Raw or um, Triple H Rock or a early Sean Razor match to where it wasn't 800 big spots to where ladder matches evolved into. And that was just going to happen eventually anyway. But it worked for exactly yeah. for what it was. It it might feel, you know, if you go back and you look at, look at it, it might feel a little unspectacular in terms of NXT main events. But at oh, yeah. the time, it certainly does its job. It crowns the champion we all wanted. And it closed out a show on a po- positive note because everybody wanted Neville to win that title at the time. Yeah, everybody did. So that is NXT Arrival. Again, that uh, February 27, 2014, obviously on the WWE Network. If you haven't watched it, that is kind of the uh, the genesis of the NXT TakeOver and where we are today. Kev, overall thoughts on the show and a score out of 10? Uh, if I had to do a score out of 10, I'd probably go... I think when I originally reviewed it, I went too high. I went like 8.5. Um, probably just because I was... Like, this was something so different and it was a, su- a success. But obviously, TakeOvers have evolved into something crazy. Um, probably go like seven, seven and a half out of ten. There's a real problem with those, not problem, but the two matches in the middle, the tag title and the mojo are just pretty bad. Um, but the three major matches all delivered. Zayn Neville's a legitimate match of the year contender almost any year that you put it in. Um, the women's match was ahead of its time and very good. The main event did exactly what it needed to, uh, easy to watch because it's an hour and 54 minutes. I think the whole show is super easy watch. Um, very good stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's around a seven or so for me. We had a lot of good stuff, but that, that middle drags it down a bit. But it was a definitely a good start to the NXT TakeOver era. Yeah. And uh, just for comparison, you said like seven to seven, five. I'll say about seven. Uh, the cumulative rating on Cage Match is actually a seven, nine for this. Seven, nine. Wow. Four. So a lot of people, wow. there's actually... There's 82 votes on it. There are actually 17 people that voted it a 10, 14, Dang. 9, 20 gave it an 8, another 20 gave it a 7. And then, like, the rest is just, like, a couple 6s and a couple 5s and then nothing under a 5. Wow. So, um, a very positively rated show. Uh, but, yeah, it's um it's definitely an important one to look back on because uh, the opener is – Something that set the stage, the women's uh, title match set the stage for what that division was going to become later that year and beyond, and what trickled into the main roster, thankfully. And then, again, the main event, you got your title change and stuff. A little sloggy in the middle, but I mean, again, it's definitely a good show. It's a good way to kick off the air, and um, it was kind of fun going back, because like I said, I remembered that Sammy and Cesaro was like a pretty great match, and then I went... Again, you know, go back and watch it. I was like, Christ, that's like better, better than I thought, dude. I'm like, that's... And I think that's always yeah, feel... fun when you go back and something's even better than you remember. 
Absolutely. I feel like this is kind of an era that often gets overlooked, not just because, you know, NXT or in general, when people do a lot of retro reviews and stuff, they tend to go further back, 80s, 90s, 2000s. But like a lot of the 2010s, because it is still kind of recent, it gets overlooked. And there's a lot of good stuff in there that we probably don't remember as well, because it's you know, like just 2016 or 2014 or something, you know, like I look back at some of those, not even if it's great or anything, but I just, I look back recently, I don't know why, at a card from like No Mercy, like 2016. And it's like, you forget that these things happen. Like I I forgot for, you know, how good that Ms. Ziggler Intercontinental title feud in 2016 was. And it's just like these things that you kind of overlook because it's not far back enough that it's uh, you know, retro, I guess, yet, and it's still a little too soon, you know, so it's just a weird time period, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. Agreed. So it's, a, again, a lot of fun to go back and check that one out. And Kev, I do want to thank you again. Like I said, you were kind of the perfect guy to go for because <laughs> you have basically been our NXT guy weekly and everything, so I thought it was good to bring you back on for this. And before you go, please shout out to Patreon and everything for everybody that might be interested. <coughs> Absolutely. Uh, Twitter would be at the Kevsta. That's the underscore K E V S T A A A. And the Patreon is the same thing. Patreon.com slash the underscore Kevsta. Um, I've been doing retro reviews. Like I said, I'm doing an ROH show from 2007. Um, I have plans to do the top 500 matches of the 2010s. Uh, it's a big undertaking, but that's on my list. Uh, weekly reviews of Dynamite, Raw, and uh, usually SmackDown. Um, so yeah, some, uh, pretty good stuff there. That's right. So if you've enjoyed hearing Kev on the shows lately, uh, give him a follow and a little support on the Patreon, a little something for the effort, you know what I'm saying? So we yeah. he, he appreciate that, but yeah, um, Kev again, thank you. I do appreciate it. And, um, I've, I've enjoyed having you on the shows. We're going to try to fit you in a little more often here. Cause we've been having a good time talking, I think. And it's, uh, yeah, we'll try to maybe do some retro reviews as well every once in a while, but, um, that is going to wrap us up for tonight. This has been the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. You can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, the 411mania.com website, and any major podcasting platform. Please make sure to subscribe to our show, share us around on social media, and if you have a time, if you have time, leave us a five-star review on the podcasting platform of your choosing. Happy wrestling, everybody.